Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple, and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 1, The Murderous Marriage. So, Aggie, you're finally marrying Mr. Wright. Roy, I keep telling you, there's a problem. Well, bound to be. I mean, it's like a car that's been left in the garage for some years. It can be ever so hard to get it started up again. I don't have that many miles on the clock. Anyway, we have been for a test drive, and I'm pleased to say the bodywork can still cope with some dangerous bends. Oh, good, because I was going to say there's always antifreeze. Roy, my problem is that I'm already married. What? Oh, uh... Roy, are you all right? No, I'm not, actually. I've just spilt my frappuccino down the front of my brand-new Dolce & Gabbana. Twenty-five years ago, I walked out on my husband. It had all been a bit of a whirlwind romance. When we finally stopped spinning, I realised it had been the biggest mistake of my life. We had absolutely nothing in common. I wanted a career. He wanted a human punch bag. Oh, Aggie. So did you get a divorce? I didn't think I needed one. I mean, my view on marriage was been there, done that, never again. And I didn't think Jimmy would even notice I was gone. The man was in a permanent alcoholic stupor. It was like being married to a beer mat. So where is he now? Well, that's the thing. Nobody knows. I mean, I assume he's dead. After I left, he went downhill fast. He was last seen living in Cardboard City. But he must have gone to that great Doss house in the sky by now. Oh, you're always such a ray of sunshine, aren't you? So presumably the wedding's off until you know for sure. Uh, no. That's just the thing. It's all going ahead on the 25th of October. But you can't get married to James if your first husband's still out there marinating his liver. Look, I just have to... I can't risk losing James. I've waited nearly four years for him to propose. If he finds out about Jimmy, he'll head for the hills. Well, surely it's better he finds out before the big day rather than on it. I mean, I prefer my wedding photos to be bridegroom and bride rather than groom, groom and bride being led to a police car. Roy, I've got to take the risk. How do you think I became a successful businesswoman? I know it's a gamble, but the sensible thing is to just press ahead and pray that he's dead. Oh, that's ever so sensible. Have you ever heard of a word called bigamy? It's in the dictionary between balmy and bonkers. Hang on. When did James actually propose? Oh, um, three months ago. So why have you only just told me? Because I knew what you'd say. What would I say? Don't do it. And that's still what I'm saying. Yes, but it's too late now. On top of everything else, I'm selling my house. No, not your dear little cottage with a lovely laburnum tree standing in a bed of cigarette butts. I want to move in with James. And with the sale of the cottage, we'll have the most wonderful life together. We'll be able to travel, see the world, eat in all the best restaurants... Well, just make sure when you leave these restaurants, you don't step over your other husband lying in the gutter. Look, he's got to be dead. He's just got to be. Wanting someone dead doesn't necessarily mean they are. Well, quite a few of my exes would be pushing up daisies. Well, that's where I want to ask a favour. I want you to go round Cardboard City and find out for sure. See if you can find anyone who knows what happened to Jimmy. Oh, what a treat. I love meeting winos in cardboard boxes. In fact, if he's not dead, I'll probably marry him myself. Uh, coming! Uh, got to go. Someone coming to look at the house. Aggie, please, this is the worst mistake since the captain of the Titanic said, no, go ahead, it's only an iceberg. Uh, thank you for your support. Goodbye. I'm just coming. <coughs> Oh, Chivers, leave the wallpaper alone. I'm trying to sell this place. Oh, it's you. Good morning to you too, Mrs. Raisin. Uh, Mrs. Wendell, sorry, I was waiting for someone to look at the house. Well, wait no longer. I come with just that very purpose. But you only live round the corner. I know, but I've recently begun a new hobby. Buying up ruined old properties and turning them into something special. Well, I've spent five years ruining this place for just such an occasion. Uh, do you want to come in? I most certainly do. I have no wish to buy a pig in a poke. Well, you can come in then and poke to your heart's content. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, I feel inspired. 
I mean, strip away the fixtures and furnishings, and you've got quite a bit of potential. And just think what could be done by someone with taste. I'm trying not to. Um, are you planning to sell your own cottage? Oh, no. You don't expect me to live here, do you? No, I see this as an investment opportunity. Really? Yes. I shall convert your house into a small hotel. But, um... There are only two bedrooms. Yes. Perhaps the bon mot is not so much petite as bijou. I shall get a proper designer in to do it. Do you know Roger from the cottage on the other side? I can't say I've had the pleasure. Oh, he's such a sweet boy. At first I thought he was gay, but it turns out no. He's just Welsh. But um, don't you need a safety certificate and fire escape? Details, Mrs. Raisin, details. And this is a very good time to get into the hospitality industry. You see, Sainsbury's has a special offer on croissant. Oh, yes. Um, perhaps you'd like a look around. Indeed. Hello, Chivers. I see you've got a lot of clothes hanging about. Are you lacking in closet space? No. Actually, I'm just uh, choosing my wedding outfit. Oh, the wedding. Oh, well, I can see that dress is an old favourite. Of course, I am unable to attend. I shall be giving my Lady Windermere's fan to the people of Prendergast. Well, I only hope they find a use for it. <clears throat> it's a funny thing, Mrs. Raisin. Yes? I was speaking to the Reverend Bloxby, and he seemed to think you were a widow. But I always thought you were a divorcee. Uh, no. No, the Reverend Bloxby's right. Really? How long have you been a widow? The normal amount of time. Um, a few years. Oh, how peculiar. Oh, well then, my mistake. Spare some change, please. Spare some change. Spare some change, please. Hello. Huh? Yeah. My name is Roy. Look, do you mind if I sit down for a minute? I'm absolutely exhausted from tram uh, walking the streets for the past six hours. But um, I wonder if you can help me. I'm looking for a gentleman of the road by the name of Jimmy Razor. Jimmy? <laughs> and there's a blast from the past. What makes you think I might know? Well, I was thinking he might be a colleague of yours. I mean, you might have slept together. I mean, I'm not suggesting there was anything sexual, obviously. Although, maybe there was. It, it's not for me to say. Oh, perhaps I do know, Jimmy. Oh, what's a worth? All right. Uh, will you tell me for five pounds? Make it ten. Oh, you drive a hard bargain. Um, five and seven, eight, nine, ten. There you go. Yes. I know. I know, Jimmy. I kind of guessed that, but um, can you tell me where he is? Aye. Well? Huh. That'll cost you extra. Honestly. Look, that's all I've got, I promise. Aye. I knew Jimmy. I knew Jimmy very well. <laughs> well, he doesn't live here anymore. So where is he living? Aye. You see that big building over there? Oh, that sort of great big glass blamont. Aye, that's the one. Well, Jimmy's gone to live in that. Oh, is it a dropout centre? I, 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 I mean, um, drop-in. Eh, something like that, but <laughs> I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't go there if you paid me. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for the information. I'd best be going. Hang on a wee minute. Who are you, by the way? I told you, my name's Roy. No, but, uh, are you the polis or the, or the social? No. Actually, I'm a public relations executive. Oh, I used to work in PR. Did you? Oh, lovely. Now I know what I've got to look forward to. Now, at this point, the bride passes her bouquet to the matron of honor. Ah, oh, um, here you are, Mrs. Blocks. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and the best man sits. Oh. Where has DC Wong got to? Lord, I think he popped out to answer his mobile. <laughs> Sorry about that. Chief Inspector having a bit of bother with joyriders. Really? Now, the congregation sits, and I... 
If there's one thing ruins the ambiance of a 17th century church, uh, it's 21st century technology. I, I, I think that would be your phone, dear. Really? Mm. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, the reference blocks, please. Oh, I can't wait to get the flowers organised. We're decorating the altar this evening on a theme of mists and mellow fruitfulness. Oh, so lovely. I've got the Carsley mm. Ladies Society scouting round the hedgerows looking for pine cones. Oh, oh marvellous. <laughs> I mean, it's always such a shame when they're just swept into the gutter. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's something I keep forgetting to ask you, Mrs. Reason. Yes? Well, I was talking to the Reverend Bloxby, and he says you still haven't managed to get hold of your husband's death certificate. Uh, no, not yet. But as you know, the circumstances of his death were somewhat unfortunate. Mm. Well, if it was anyone else, that would be a problem. But I do trust you implicitly. And have you sorted out your honeymoon yet? Oh, oh yes. We're off to Corsica. Sun, oh. sand, and a bracing stroll to Napoleon's birthplace. Oh. <laughs> uh, just as soon as the sale of my cottage goes through. A little bird told me Mrs. Wendell was buying your house. Oh. A little bird told the truth. Oh, how lovely. Oh, that will be nice. You'll have Mrs. Wendell living next door to you. <laughs> yes, we'll have Mrs. Wendell living next door to us. I must say, it, it, it's the most marvellous time of year to be getting married. I mean, it's just to the point when it all seems so grey on autumnal and suddenly, I feel as if it's springtime. Oh. No, no, really, it's all so exciting. I find it quite hard to finish my breakfast some mornings. <gasps> oh, what? Mrs. What? Reason, are you all right? Oh, uh, Mrs. Bloxby, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a large brown rat oh. Oh. just uh, oh, yes. underneath oh. the communion oh, rail. Oh, Lord, so there is. I told Alf there were some strange marks in the communion wafers. Still, at least it's a Church of England, wrote it. <laughs> right. Uh, perhaps you uh, want to get a hold of Renekill? Oh, yes, mm. straight away. I mean, it would be awful if something like that turned up in the middle of Mrs. Raisin's wedding. <laughs> Raisin. Hmm, Raisin. Ra oh, of course, you mean Jimmy. That's the one. Yes, Jimmy Raisin. One of our success stories. Do you know, when we met Jim, he was in a bad way. Oh, but now he's off the drink, taking pride in his appearance, and he's even got a little job in the local library. So you mean he's alive? Yes. He wouldn't be awfully good as a librarian if he were dead. No, I suppose not. Hmm. Did you say you wanted to see him? Oh, if it's not too much trouble. Um, I think it's wonderful what you do with these, um... These, um... People? That's the word. And you're a relative, are you? Um, no, a friend of a friend of a friend sort of thing. We only just found out that he was a homeless. I mean, a homeless person. Or a person with homelessness. Uh, uh, and why exactly did you want to visit him? To tell him that we care. Right. Well, um, Jimmy's not in the best of health, so I'd rather you didn't stay too long. Hmm? Uh, but if you'd like to follow me... Ah, oh, Jimmy. Oh, hello there. You've uh, got a visitor here, Roy. Have I now? Oh, that's nice. Hello there, Jimmy. Long time no see. Yes. In fact, I can't remember when I last saw you. Right. Uh, well, I'll leave you two alone, shall I? Ah, uh, thanks, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. So, who the hell are you? Um, my name is Roy. But that's not important. I'm here on behalf of a woman called Agatha Razor. Do you remember her? You used to be married to her. Oh, no. There's no use to be. Me and Agatha are still married. Hello? Aggie, do you want the good news or the bad? Good news. Jimmy Raisin's only got six weeks to live. Oh, and the bad? He wants to come and visit you. What? Apparently, he read about your forthcoming nuptials in the Daily Telegraph. Jimmy wouldn't read the Telegraph. No, but he has been known to sleep under it. You don't get the same warmth under a tabloid. Oh, James would have to put an announcement in the one remaining broadsheet. He, um, he seems quite a nice chap, really. And I think he still carries a torch for you. I do not need to hear that. But, I mean, he's not likely to make it to the Cotswold in his condition, is he? Ooh, can you imagine the consequences if he did? Especially on your wedding day. Look, it's not going to end up that way, because on the big day, you will be outside the church on sentry duty. And if Jimmy turns up... Aggie, Aggie. Oh, I hate to say it, but I can't actually come to your wedding. What? 
Well, my mum's going to be in hospital. She's having a hip replacement. She's been waiting over a year. One year? I've been waiting nearly five years for my wedding. Well, let's just hope it's not like waiting for a bus. You wait five years for a husband, and then two come along. Oh, Mrs. Reason, I can hardly believe it's finally happening. I mean, all that planning and the big days are finally here. Yes. I mean, I know you and James have been so close for so long, but I just thought he was a confirmed old bachelor married to the Daily Telegraph crossword. I know. But you have done the most wonderful thing. You followed your heart. You found happiness. You made a miracle happen. Mrs. Bloxby. Yes. Please stop talking. Oh, right. Welcome, everyone, to the joining together in matrimony of two of our village's most colourful characters, Colonel James Lacey and Mrs. Agatha Raisin. It's so good to see so many people here today. If you could all perhaps shuffle along your queues, there should be plenty of room for everyone. Thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. In the presence of uh, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have come together to witness. Who is that? So you decided to start without me, did you? Who is this man? Nobody. Ah, this is all a very pretty sight. Much more impressive than our day at Dagenham Town Hall. Agatha, what's going on? Is it some sort of practical joke? I only wish it was, James. Well, if it's not a joke, you've got an awful lot of explaining to do. Ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony will adjourn for a few moments. May I ask Mrs. Asquith to play us some suitable music? <laughs> Let me get this straight. You're saying you used to be married to Mrs. Reason. Oh, no. Me and Aggie are still married. And I've even got the piece of paper to prove it. Agatha, you said that he was dead. And I thought he was. Years ago, I heard he was back on the bottle, sleeping rough. It didn't have long to live. But it's always just as well to check. James, I'm sorry. Agatha, you've just made a complete fool of me in front of the entire village and tell me the worst kind of lie imaginable. I don't think sorry is really good enough. I didn't know, James. I thought he was dead. Well, I don't know if this is the right time to say it, but in the eyes of the law, ignorance is no defence. No, Alf, it is not the right time to say it. Mrs. Raisin made a mistake that her marriage had clearly broken down, so there's no reason why she shouldn't get a divorce, and, and perhaps you and James could marry at a registry office. Actually, Mrs. Bloxby, there is a reason. Because there's a little thing called trust. And when that is gone, you can't marry someone. Not today, tomorrow, or any other day. Ah, oh, don't upset yourself, Agatha. All is not lost. You've still got me. Get off me. Look, here's some money so you can get back to whatever hole you crawled out of. Well, how about a little kiss for the journey? I could... Kill you, Jimmy. I could kill you for what you've done to me. That's enough, Agatha. Now, I think you've done what you came here for, sir. And if I could just take a statement, then one of my men would escort you back to London. Is that so, officer? And aren't you going to arrest this woman? That is no concern to you whatsoever. Um, perhaps we could just slip out the back door and, and pop along to the vicarage and discuss all this a bit more calmly. We've got nothing to discuss. The wedding is off. And if they do choose to arrest you, Agatha, don't count on me as a character witness. James, I didn't mean it to end up like this. Look, excuse me, everybody. I really do feel we should send everyone home. And tell Mrs. Asquith she can stop playing now. Oh, it's you. Uh, yes, Mrs. Wendell, it's me. I don't know if you've heard. I have indeed. The news of your behaviour has spread through the countryside like foot and mouth disease. Yes, well, as you can imagine, right now, James doesn't want to be under the same roof as me. Well, 
Well, I can't say I'm surprised. Still, hopefully one day he'll pick up the pieces and start anew with someone worthy of him. Yes, well, right now there's just the small problem of where I'm going to live, and I was wondering, could I possibly stay on in my cottage? Oh, Mrs. Raisin, of course you can stay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That'll be £50 per person per night, plus a £200 deposit. No, I meant, can I buy my cottage back? Oh, I think not, Mrs. Raisin. You may see this place as a house, but to me it's more like a goose. A goose, Mrs. Wendell? A goose that's laying golden eggs. Now, you're welcome to stay so long as you abide by my rules. Number one, no gentleman callers. I have my reputation to think of. I mean, it chills me to the bone to think I'll be having a bigamist in my back bedroom. Still, I shall boil wash the sheets in the morning. Well, I could always sleep on the floor. Rule two, breakfast is at eight o'clock sharp. It's a toasted croissant with conserves and marmalade and a soupçon of café au lait. Oh, good. Nothing like a full English. Number three, no pets. There's only room for one puss puss in this house, and my Himalayan long hair must have priority. Come along. The answer phone of James Lacey. Please leave a message. Uh, James, it's me. And I realise right now you'd rather have your tongue torn out than talk to me. But please believe me. I didn't want this to happen. I thought Jimmy was dead. He's certainly been dead to me for 25 years. But I was terrified of losing you. And I'll do anything I can to put things right between us. (sighs) Chiffers? Oh, Chivers. Has James kicked you out as well? You can stay here tonight if you're very quiet. This isn't our house anymore. It's Mrs. Wendell's bed and breakfast come prisoner of war camp. That's right. You curl up on the bed. Nothing can stop you sleeping. But I'm going for a walk. Okay, God, so it's the middle of the night and I'm stuck in a field and even if I do find my way out, I've lost everything I ever cared for. Well, is there any way you could squeeze just a little bit more misery? Could you make me suffer just a little bit more? Oh, thank you so much. Oh, Oh, no, Agatha, it's a small one. Jimmy, what the hell are you doing here? Well, that's not very nice. And I made so much effort to come up and see you. You made my life hell 30 years ago, and as soon as I found a better one, you came to destroy that as well. You should never have walked out on me. And you shouldn't have done the things you did. I never laid a finger on you. The bruises have gone, Jimmy, but the memories won't fade. Ah, don't be like that. I had to walk 80 miles to get here, you know. Sleeping in ditches, eating whatever the bin man left behind. Oh, how's about a kiss for your ever-loving husband? Get off me! Hello? Mrs. Raisin. Firstly, good morning. Secondly, may I say that your breakfast is now on the compost heap. Never mind, your loss is the earthworm's gain. Fair enough. Thirdly, I seem to remember telling you there were no pets at this establishment. Well, either that's a cat on the lower part of your anatomy, or you really do need to get your legs waxed. Chivers managed to climb up the drain pipe. Still, I'm sure you can always put up an electrified fence. And fourthly, the Mercedeshire police are here to see you. What? Bill Wong, you know, and um, WPC something or other. What do they want? Well, you know, I think it might be something to do with the attempted bigamy. Either that or they're holding a village fete and they want to use your wedding dress as a raffle prize.
Bill, can I just say I'm so sorry? Good morning, Mrs. Reason. This is WPC Heard. Hello. I don't have any excuse. I know what I did was wrong. Really? Yes, and I'm actually looking forward to prison. You really mean that? Indeed. After eight hours staying with Mrs. Wendell, all I can say is hooray for Holloway. Well, really. Mrs. Wendell, we will let you know if and when we need you. Oh, all right. Uh, I'll just get on with the dusting. Mrs. Reason, what are you actually confessing to? Attempted bigamy. I thought Jimmy was dead. Right. Now, is that all you're admitting to? Well... What were you hoping for? That I abducted Lord Lucan? That I made wallpaper paste out of Shergar? Did you leave a message last night on the answer phone of Mr James Lacey? Well, yes. If I'd popped round, I'd only have had the door slammed in my face and I didn't much fancy a broken nose. And what exactly did you say in this answer phone message? Oh, I don't remember every word, but I think the underlying theme was I'm sorry. Did you perhaps use the words, I'll do anything I can to put things right... Well, now you come to mention it. Bill, what's all this about? One hour after making that call, you were observed by a local farmer having an altercation with Mr Jimmy Raisin. Well, yes, I was. And I think I shoved him into a ditch. What did you expect me to do, help him make a daisy chain? Shortly after this altercation, Jimmy Raisin was found dead. Do you have any explanation for this? No. No, he can't be. Agatha Raisin, believe me, I... Really don't want to do this, but uh, hold on. What? That that's him. That's him in that photograph. Which photograph, Mrs. Raisin? The photograph on the television. That's Jimmy. Agatha, that is a photograph of Mr. Norman Wendell, Mrs. Wendell's late husband. But it's Jimmy. Can't you see? I can see very clearly, and that is not Jimmy Raisin. That is Norman Wendell. I knew him extremely well, and he died nearly five years ago. It can't be. It's Jimmy. But what's he doing on Mrs. Wendell's television? She's obviously playing for time. No. Agatha Raisin, I am arresting you for the murder of Jimmy Raisin. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you... Bill, no! I'm innocent! In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy and DC Wong by Stephen Hogan. James Holmes was Roy, Tina Gray, Mrs. Wendell. John Rogan was Jimmy and Tim Whitnell was Martin. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 2, The Disappearing Trick. Yes, Chivers, I know I've been neglecting you, but you do only get one phone call from police custody. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, it must have been such an ordeal. It was indeed, Mrs. Bloxby. Especially going without cigarettes for 24 hours. Still, all that matters is getting my name cleared and the charges dropped. Oh, well, you're welcome to stay at the vicarage for as long as that takes. Oh, thank you. And thanks for looking after Chivers. Oh, it's no trouble at all. She's the perfect house guest. And every morning she brings us a nice dead squirrel for breakfast. Oh, Chivers... (laughs) Now, do help yourself to some toasted tea cakes and some homemade hawthorn jelly. Is it made with actual hawthorns? That's right. We're putting together a little cookbook at the Lady Society full of recipes you can make from things you find in the hedgerow. What a pity all I ever find is dead bodies. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, I'm so sorry. I I wasn't thinking. It's all right. It was a very short-lived marriage. And I haven't seen Jimmy for quite a few years. Oh, well. Oh, I do hope they find who did it soon. And then your name can be cleared. Well, I can't wait around for the police to solve things. I'm off to London at the weekend to find out a bit about Jimmy's final days. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, do be careful. It isn't safe in London. Although, obviously, it's not always safe around here. Quite. (laughs) Though, don't worry. I will have Roy with me. Oh, well, at least you've got someone to keep an eye on you. Yes, Roy can be deadly. Especially if you spill his Malibu and pineapple. (laughs) So, where exactly will you be going? Well, we're heading for a drop-in centre that Jimmy used to visit. Yes, but hold on. Won't they know you've been charged with his murder? Ah. 
Well, uh, oh, I'll have to think of a pseudonym, won't I? Yeah. But um, before all that, I really need to talk to James, although I know right now I'm the last person he wants to see. Oh, yes, James. <clears throat> What's the matter? Um, he came round this morning uh, when you were sleeping. He said he was off to stay with his sister for a few days in, in Greenwich. Oh, I see. So I get arrested for murder and he goes swanning off to see his sister. Well, it has all been a shock for him, too. Oh, he did leave me the keys to his cottage and he said you could stay there just until he got back. Oh, I wouldn't dare go into his perfect cottage. I mean, he's so pernickety. The slightest bit of fag ash on his carpet and he has a fit. Oh, dear. So I should be heading straight for London, which means, Mrs. Bloxby, you've got dead squirrel on the menu for a little while longer. Right, Aggie, walk this way and let me do the talking. As long as you don't get arrested for indecent exposure. What's that supposed to mean? Well, just because we're going to a homeless centre, do you have to dress like a Dickensian street urchin? Right, Sarah, if you could take these to the laundry, please. Hello. Oh, uh, hello. Do I know you? We met a few weeks ago. My name's Roy Silver. Oh, of course. Uh, you were an old friend of Jimmy's. Uh, and this would be... This is my mum, Mrs. Silver. We came to pay our condolences and uh, to give your organisation a small donation. Oh. Huh. Not as small as all that. <laughs> well, we know you did such wonderful things for Jimmy in his final days. Uh, what exactly was your connection with Jimmy Raisin? Well... Mother knew him years ago when they used to work in Fleet Street. Oh, I'd forgotten Jimmy used to work in newspapers. It's ironic he ended up sleeping in them. Well, uh, he could have written some interesting stories about his final years... If he'd only been well enough to write them down. Really? And uh, what stories would these be? Mrs. Silver, I don't normally divulge information about our clients, but as he is a client no longer, Jimmy was extremely popular around here. What are you trying to say? Was he some sort of cardboard city Casanova? I mean, he was very good at getting people into his confidence. He had the kind of face that said, the confession light is on, please come in. And he became a kind of agony uncle to a lot of our clients. Mm, but how much of the agony was caused by him? Exactly. If you told him a bit too much, he could turn from confessor to executioner. Are you saying he used to blackmail people? Well, as you can imagine, most of the people who use this place are on benefits. But the odd one or two may do a bit of work, cash in hand. And Jimmy would see to it that he always got his cut. Or else the DSS found out. Oh, charming. Nothing like stealing a crust of bread from the starving. I did everything I could for Jimmy. Made sure he was clean and well-fed and looked after. But he wasn't exactly grateful. So if it was possible for the world to find out what kind of person he was, that would suit me down to the ground. What goes around comes around. It seems at the end, Jimmy was just the same man I knew and loathed. Aggie? Yes? This sister of James. Oh, yes? Do you know where she lives? Yes, I do. As soon as I moved in with James, I copied his address book into my file of facts. You know, you can take being a patrol freak a bit too far. It comes when you start copying out all your partner's personal details into your diary. You never know when you might need them. Indeed. So, um, shall we pay them a little visit? No, absolutely not. I'm trying not to think about James. I'll be having his Sunday lunch right now. I wonder what it is. No, 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 he's better off without me. He's probably having a whale of a time. Now he hasn't got me to boss him about. James, are you actually going to eat that? Well, you know, I just thought I'd slide it round my plate for a little longer. I did go to a lot of effort to make it. Harriet, I do appreciate all the effort you're making, the constant cups of tea, and, and the effort to pair me up with Bunty at the Bridge Club. Well, she's a very nice girl. That woman has the personal hygiene of a warthog, a laugh like a hyena, and the appetite of a gannet. Frankly, her ideal partner would be David Attenborough. It's 
her, isn't it? Oh, Lord. You're letting that woman have power over you. She broke your heart, and now, thanks to her, you're all skin and bone. Yes, well, those are two of the major constituents of the human body. Look, James, you really need to move on. So why do you keep going on about her? Well, why won't you have anything to eat? Uh, well, that could be multiple reasons. Perhaps I'm simply not in the mood for monkfish. Look, it's only been a week. You can't expect me to just snap out of it. Oh, honestly. Well, if that's the Jehovah's Witnesses, I shall tell them I'm a Satanist. Yes? Hello. Yes. Um, is, is, um, is James Lacey there? Who wants to know? Agatha Raisin. I mean, uh, that's not me, obviously. She's waiting in the car. Oh, the brazen Mrs. Raisin. Well, I always knew she was the Wicked Witch of the East, so I'm not surprised she sends munchkins to do her dirty work. What's going on, Harriet? Who is... Oh, it's you. Yes, James, it's me. Well, I don't suppose you've come round to borrow a cup of sugar. No, I've come here to tell you that you really need to have a word with Agatha. Uh, do I indeed? And what's there to talk about? Well, she wants to say sorry and to find out how you really feel about her. Really? Well, I'd have thought the fact that I've just moved 80 miles away from her might give some sort of clue. Well said, James. Now push off, you horrible little man. Look, I'm not going till you promise to talk to Aggie. Get your foot out of my door. You're ruining my beautiful Farrow and Ball paintwork. Well, you're not doing much for my fabulous Prada trainers. It's all right, Harriet. You can put him down. I think I'm the one you want to strangle. Agatha. James. So, um... Did you get my letters, my emails, my answer phone and text messages? I did indeed. I pressed delete so many times I may suffer from repetitive strain injury. James, I am so sorry about what happened and I didn't mean to hurt you. I really thought Jimmy was dead and when I found out he wasn't, well, by then it was too late. And I knew he was going to die eventually. We're all going to die eventually. You really should have waited for him to make a decent fist of it. But that's the difference between you and me. When I was in the army, if we had orders to kill, it wasn't enough for the enemy to be nearly dead or well on the way or dead-ish. They did actually have to reach a state where their toes were turning blue. I know what I did was wrong, but I only did it because... I couldn't bear the thought of losing you. Alas, I had similar feelings towards you, although, in retrospect, I realise I was misguided. James... Your phone is ringing. It doesn't matter. This is important. I really think you should pick up. There's clearly one person in this world who wants you. Hello. Well, I hope you're pleased with yourself. What's that supposed to mean? Really? Picking on a poor woman when she's at her most vulnerable. She's about as vulnerable as a Sherman tank. When did this happen? Breaking her heart like a tiny flower crushed underfoot. I used to have a heart once. Really? Well, I find that very hard to believe. Now, if you'll excuse me, we're finishing off our Sunday lunch. Yes, of course. Well, I hope you choke on a chicken bone. Actually, we're not having chicken. We're having monkfish. Oh, yes, of course. Well, pardon me for messing with a man who eats monkfish. Indeed. Indeed. I'll be there right away. Thanks. Well, James, it looks as though you'll have to avoid eye contact with me for a little bit longer. Mrs. Wendell is prepared to sell my cottage back to me, so I'll be moving next door to you in a few days. Oh, Lord. Furthermore, the police have dropped all charges, so I'm an innocent woman. Well, that's debatable. And since good things come in threes, I'm off to buy a lottery ticket. Come along, Roy. Bye. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Raisin, I suppose it's all worked out rather well. Not only do you get your house back, but I've had the whole place redecorated. So I see. I've never seen so many gold light fittings. Oh, that was Roger's doing. He says you don't need to be a dame to live like Barbara Cartland. But, you know, I don't feel it's worth all the effort. I'm fed up with having to rise at six in the morning to make half a dozen breakfasts. Mrs. Wendell, apart from me, I don't think you've ever had any guests. I know, which makes the whole process all the more demoralising. The mind boggles. I mean, I've tried, really I've tried. I went down to a local restaurant to distribute flyers. The Waddling Duck, do you know it? I haven't been, but on a clear day I can smell their bouillabaisse. It's supposed to have two Michelin stars, but in the whole restaurant there was only one person wearing a tie, and that had a picture of Homer Simpson on it. These are not my kind of people. These are people who go on holiday to Falaraki and share Elko Pops with people from Swindon. Well, they'd have felt at home here. Frankly, 
I feel this whole country has gone to the dogs. So, I've decided to move somewhere where British values are still upheld. I'm opening a small hotel on the Falkland Islands. Mrs. Wendell, uh, when do you set sail? In a few days' time, but not before my swan song performance at the village hall. We're putting on a little something with singing and dancing and scenes from Titus Andronicus. We're calling it the Carsley Talent Show. Why are you calling it that? Of course, I shall be doing what I usually do with Noel Coward. And if there's time, I shall try and wrap my tonsils round Ivor Novello. Are you coming? I think I'm busy that night. When is it? On Saturday at one o'clock sharp. But you know... Even show business doesn't have the same allure that it used to. Once the audiences sat there absolutely wrapped, hanging on to my every aphorism. Now they sit there unwrapping boiled sweets, hanging on till the cream tea in the interval. So you see, I'm just an old actress who's lost her motivation. Mrs. Raisin, thank you so much for helping. No bother at all, Mrs. Boxby. Anyway, I always think these concerts sound much better from the kitchen. Yes, just listen to Mrs. Oh. Wendell. We're trying to raise money to repair the roof, but I think at this rate we might need a new one. Or a whole new village. <laughs> do, you know, do you know, there was a misprint in the programme. Apparently she's performing a medley from the Pilates of Pensals. <laughs> I tried Pilates once. They've been in absolute agony, but not as much as this. <laughs> ah, but we shall miss her when she's in the Falklands. Yes, they will probably still hear her. Oh, and I pity those poor penguins. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Bloxby? Yes, dear. When did she decide to set sail? Oh, it was all rather sudden, really. I think it was just after the police dropped their charges against you. Oh. Really? Yes. Well, that's the refreshments already. Shall we go and catch the end of Act One? Oh, yes. It's Bill Wong doing whatever it is he does. <laughs> oh, let's take the trolley with us, shall we? I think people might be glad of a cup of tea. Well, they've <laughs> certainly earned it. <laughs> Constable Wong, and he's oh, going to be performing feats of mystery and imagination, and they'll be followed by a much welcome cup of tea. Oh, Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Bill Wong. Uh, go on, Bill. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> oh, <here we> go. <laughs> now, for my first trick, I'm going to be needing a volunteer from the audience. Now, how about you, madam? Uh, oh, no, uh, uh, I'm just off to get Oh, no, I think we all want to see Mrs. Wendell in my magic cabinet, don't we, ladies? <laughs> Come here and mind your feather bow in the door, will you? Wendell, in you go. That's it. That's it. He does it. Now, I close the door and I say the magic words. Hocus pocus, let's have a beer. Make Mrs. Wendell disappear. <laughs> oh, where is she gone? I'll just file a missing persons report, and then I say, Hocus, hocus, come back, my beauty. One more beer. Not while I'm on duty. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Where is she gone? I'm not surprised you can't find her, Bill. Can't find your brains on a good side. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mrs. Parker. Thank, thank you. Mrs. Bloxby. Yes, dear. Uh, could you hold the fort for a minute? I have a disappearing act of my own to do. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes uh, of course. Um, uh, okay, uh, everybody, uh, tea's being served. Um, Mrs. Asquith, could you come and lend a hand? Uh, Mrs. Wendell? Oh, Mrs. Raisin, you caught me by surprise. Not half as surprised as Bill Wong was when he found his magic cabinet empty. Oh, yes, I, I feel dreadful about that. I just suddenly had an attack of claustrophobia. Indeed, there were 100 people who witnessed your terror. Ah, uh, well, I, I must get back. Lots of packing and so forth. I'll come with you. Uh, well, uh, 
You can come as far as my threshold, but I, I'm afraid I'm far too busy to ask you in for tea. Oh, a cup of tea is the last thing I was hoping for. Very well, then, but quick, six. I've got lots to do. Oh, you can't go that way. What? Why ever not? Well, uh, Mulberry Street's closed with a burst water main, oh. but uh, we could cut across Hunter's Field. All right. Hunter's Field it is, then. I must say, it's come as a bit of a surprise to everyone that you're leaving, having been part of village life for so long. Really? Well, I can think of many reasons one might wish to leave England. And if you don't know them, I suggest you read the Daily Mail. Interesting that you made your decision just after the police dropped their charges against me. I wasn't aware of the precise timing. The whole world doesn't revolve around you, you know. I imagine when the police let me go and started looking for new suspects, one or two people must have been very anxious. Well, I'm sure the murderer was. Whoever he or she might be. Yes, they must have been. Almost as anxious as you were when D.C. Wong led you into a small dark cabinet and closed the door. Mrs. Raisin, you seem to be off on one of your reveries again. Hmm. Hardly surprising. After all, we are in the exact spot where Jimmy was murdered. Are we? Oh, I didn't know that. I went for a walk in the middle of the night and I happened to bump into Jimmy. We had a blazing row, at the end of which I pushed him backwards into this ditch. Oh. Only I now realise Jimmy and I weren't alone. Someone had followed me here, and when I was gone, they stayed and finished off what I'd started. Oh, how very tragic. Are you all right, Mrs. Wendell? Uh, yes. Uh, why shouldn't I be? You seem to be uh, fingering your pearls. Well, it, it, it unsettles me, talking about about that poor man. And yet you never met Jimmy. Or did you? Mrs. Raisin, what are you insinuating? Mrs. Wendell, believe me, I'm the only person in the world who knows what you went through. Jimmy had a horrible habit of hurting women. He spent weeks using his silver-tongued charm on them... But as soon as they were under his spell, he would put the boot in. Now, I don't know what he did to you, but I promise you, you don't have to suffer alone. Mrs. Raisin, of all the people in the world I could unburden my heart to, I never thought I'd choose you. I... I met Jimmy just over 20 years ago. It was when my husband Norman and I were first married. You never met Norman, did you? But... He was a wonderful man, big and broad-shouldered, but with puppy dog's eyes. And in those days, everything between us was almost perfect. Except? Except um, we couldn't have children. Norman said not to worry, we had each other. But I kept thinking, if we didn't have a family, what was going to keep us together when my charms started to fade? My doctor seemed to think the problem lay with Norman rather than me, but he refused to accept there was a problem. He he said, just give it time. The stalk will arrive when it's good and ready. Yes, men are awfully good at burying their heads in the sand. But um, where does Jimmy come into this? On our fifth wedding anniversary, Norman whisked me away to the most wonderful hotel in West London. I mean, we're talking crystal chandeliers in every bathroom. But sometimes, if you're in the most beautiful surroundings, it only makes you realise how lonely you are inside. I know the feeling well. Jimmy Raisin was working in that hotel as a bar steward. A frightfully dangerous occupation for someone with his condition. And every evening... As I lost myself in a creme de menthe, he used to look at me with his beautiful emerald eyes. Yes, they were beautiful when they weren't swimming. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, this is so hard to say, but mm, I won't be free till I've said it. Sometimes, when Norman was snoring, I would go downstairs for a nightcap. Jimmy poured me a drink and... I poured out my troubles. And after one drink led to another and another, I let him take a long, hard look into my well of loneliness. And when we were both up to our necks, so to speak, 
He told me that he could give me the most wonderful gift that would probably save my marriage. He could give me the gift of a baby. I can almost hear him say it. He had the power to make you believe that everything would turn out just right, just perfect, just the way you dream. I know. And all I could dream about was having a baby. I know it sounds sordid, but we were strangers in the night. For one insane moment, it seemed the answer to my prayers. Jimmy did bear an extraordinary resemblance to Norm. So if our liaison should have borne fruit, the, the baby would have had Norman's puppy dog eyes and Norman's perfect little nose. So you went to bed with Jimmy. Not to bed as such. We made love behind the bar on a packing crate containing 200 bottles of Canada Dry. Nine months later, my son Edward was born. He was gorgeous. I, I mean, he still is gorgeous. And for one magical moment, it looked like we were all going to live happily ever after. But there's always a twist in the tale? Yes, I forgot that as an employee of the hotel, Jimmy was able to find out where I lived, and he naturally turned up to wet the baby's head. He was a very hard man to get rid of. Indeed, and he stood on my doorstep, demanding to see our son. But Norman was home, and he heard every word. He sent Jimmy away, but the damage was already done. It poisoned our marriage. Norman never forgave me, and in time... He even turned Edward against me. I mean, Eddie's at college now, but he never phones. He never writes. When you first met me, Mrs. Wendell, you must have been a bit surprised by my surname. I mean, Raisin's not the most common of names. It did surprise me, and it wasn't long before the penny dropped. It's a very small world, Mrs. Raisin. But then, broken-hearted women always seem to gravitate towards villages in much the same way that drunks move to big cities. A month before my wedding, you were very keen to find out if Jimmy was still alive. At first, I thought you were just being nosy. But now, I realise you wanted to know if he'd be coming to the wedding or not. That's right, Mrs. Raisin. Because the very thought of it made my blood run cold. And when I heard he was here, I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. But I thought, stay calm, wait for him to leave. I won't see him, I won't talk to him. But you left the house in the middle of the night, and I couldn't resist the temptation to follow. <sighs> Mrs. Wendell, it took a lot of courage for you to tell me this. And now... I really think you should tell the police. Because even if you run away, the pain will go with you and you'll never be free. Jimmy will have you in his power forever. I couldn't tell the police. I, I mean, they wouldn't understand what I've been through. What Jimmy led me to. Well, then I will gladly stand up in court and tell the world what a monster Jimmy was and quite how far I would have gone to get rid of him. But that's just the thing. We'll never get rid of him. What do you mean? Oh, Jimmy hasn't gone. He's still here. He's lying over there in that ditch. Mrs. Wendell, I'm not falling for that. Oh, there is someone. It's all right, ladies. It's only me. And I'd like you both to accompany me to the police station. Poor Mrs. Wendell. Yes. I don't exactly approve of what she did, but I can understand exactly what led her to it. Mm. I do hope prison isn't too much of a trial. Oh, she's a tough old bird. Yes, yes. And, of course, they do have drama groups and singing. She could even put on concerts for all the other inmates. <laughs> and for once in her life, she's got a captive audience. <laughs> right. Now, there's just a small matter of making peace with James. Oh, yes. <clears throat> James. I mean, why does he still have to avoid me? I know I did a terrible thing, but he surely knows what I've just been through. Uh, well, I, I, it's not so much that he's uh, avoiding you. It's more that he, um, he uh, isn't actually here anymore. Oh, he hasn't gone back to Greenwich, surely? Um, no, uh, a little bit further afield. Um, uh, Corsica. What? 
But that's where we were going for our honeymoon. How could it? Oh, Mrs. Rayson, it hasn't been easy for James either, but I think he just wanted a little bit of peace and quiet and some time on his own. Really? Well, James, that may be what you want, but I'm coming to get you. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Harriet was played by Belinda Lang, and Mrs. Bloxby by Liza Sadovy. Stephen Hogan was DC Wong. James Holmes, Roy. Tina Gray, Mrs. Wendell, and Tim Whitnell was Martin. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M. C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M. C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple, and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode three. The Terrible Tourist. Hello, Mrs. Bloxby, it's me. Yes, I got here in one piece, in spite of flight delays, security scares, or oh, in some frankly terrifying airline food. Yes, the sun is shining. It's always shining in Corsica. It begins to get slightly tedious. <coughs> oh, um, hold on, that's the door. Come in! Your breakfast, madame. Oh, good, a breakfast tray. Uh, could you put it next to yesterday's breakfast tray or the lunch tray or the supper tray? In fact, you could add it to my tray collection. Shall I remove these, madame? Oh, there's an idea. But, sorry, Mrs. Bloxby. No, there's no sign of James, and I've been round all the tourist attractions, so I suppose all I can do is wait. <clears throat> I go now. That's another good idea, unless you were planning to stay and watch me eat it. So, um, that's where I am. I mean, it's all very scenic, the sea is very green, the sky is very blue, but I can't say any of it thrills me. I suppose all I can do is hope for some interesting cloud formations. That, yes. I go now. Are you still here? Oh, oh, I see. Um, here you go, uh, five euros. Thank you, madame. Good morning. And the same to you. Sorry about that, Mrs. Bloxby. The staff are maintaining the French reputation for dreadful customer service, and I'm keeping up the British reputation for whinging. Anyway, no news. I'll, I'll let you know if there is any. Yes. Uh, bye. Finally, breakfast. Oh, honestly, is it that hard to put the tea bag in the pot before you pour on the boiling water? Hang on a minute. I wonder, would he know? Excuse me. Yes, madame. Uh, Jean-Pierre, I was wondering, could you give me a list of all the car hire firms on the island? But yesterday I gave you the address of Course Cars. Yes, I know you're on commission from Course Cars, and every time you say their name you get a euro, but I want the address of all the hire firms. No, madame, there is no need. Course Cars is the main one. Oh, listen, why didn't you stop being so difficult and give me what I want? No, madame, not possible. I go now. Yes, you do that. When I was a girl, I wanted to marry a charming Frenchman. What a pity there aren't any. Ah, now then, one across. Oh, dear. Hello? Ah, Brinsley, thank you so much for getting back to me. Yes, I think I left a message on your answer phone, and then you phoned back and talked to my answer phone. Oh, yes, it's absolutely superb on the island. Bracing weather, lots to do, and, of course, I'm only a short jog away from Napoleon's birthplace. I have internet access, so, of course, I can download the Daily Telegraph crossword and the Sudoku. And, and you'll never guess. There's actually a shop here that, that sells Robertson's marmalade. <laughs> no, I have not seen Mrs. Raisin. I haven't heard from her, and I do not intend getting in touch. Life is too short and too precious to waste on past mistakes. Oh, yeah. well, well, that may be your view. But I would rather have my eyes gouged out by heading gulls than see that woman again. Y yes, harsh, but fair. Yeah. Well, 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 thanks for spending, Brinsley. And you can tell Harriet she's not to worry. And she's not to overwater her patholidiums. Goodbye. Right. Oh, where was I? 
one across. Madman is at a mountainous island. Eight letters. Madman is at a mountainous island. Well, I must say, I'm disappointed. I've spent all day running round like a chicken in a basket and I've not seen Edna Taylor in my museum. Tell you what, love, shall I ask them at the bar? Oh, what would they know? I mean, they can't even make a cup of tea. Honestly, it's like hitting your head against the glass wall. Well, look, Olivia and I would love to see Bonifacio. Bonifacio? What, that big place up on the hillock? It's a beautiful medieval town with a Gothic church and a cemetery. Well, if you want to spend your day chin-wagging with corpses, that's you a shout. But I'm not going up all them steps. My feet would kill me if I did that. Look, perhaps we should just split up. George and I can go to Bonifacio and you can look for your museum. Oh, that's very nice. We take you all this way and you drop us like a cat on octin roof. Um, excuse me. Oh, hello there. I couldn't help noticing you were speaking English. Well, we do our best. I was wondering, do you know your way around the island? We haven't seen as much of it as we'd like to. Yeah, uh, come and sit with us. Oh, thank you. Hold on, I think I know you. Aren't you staying at the Imperial Hotel? Yes, I am, actually. I knew I knew your voice from somewhere. You're down the corridor from us. I'm sure I've heard you shouting at room service. Oh, dear. Guilty as charged. Uh, my name's George, by the way. I'm Agatha. Olivia. I'm Sam. And I'm Ella. Oh, so you're... Yeah, that's right. We're Sam and Ella. We've heard all the jokes. Yes, I can imagine. Well, I was just wondering... Gee, I wouldn't fancy an egg butty off them two. <laughs> quite. <laughs> now, do you... They know... say you are what you eat. So what the hell have you two been having? <laughs> yes, now, I was wondering, do you have any idea how to get to Pimoggio? You know, the old town up on the mountainside. I did ask at tourist information, but they shrugged at me in a menacing manner. Uh, well, there is a road. It's all right if you like hairpin bends, falling rocks and suicidal sheep. Hang on, there's a cable car, isn't there? A cable car? Oh, well, that could be a problem. You see, I'm... I know. Why don't we all go together to see the old town? Well, why on earth should we? Well, we can't seem to make our minds up about where to go. I mean, I want to see my museum and you've got your heart set on that bony whatnot. <laughs> so great. Let's go somewhere that neither of us wants to go. Look, I hate to say it, but if the only way is via a cable car, I'm not... Not sure if I can make it. What's the matter, love? Are you not too good with heights? The height itself isn't a problem. It's more the 200 foot drop underneath it. Well, don't you worry about a thing, love. You'll just put yourself in my capable arms. I have cured so many people of their lumbago. I think you mean vertigo. You say tomato, I say tomato. Honestly. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Le voyage au Pimogio va prendre trois minutes exactement. Now, look at me, Mrs. Raisin. Hold on to my hands and look into my eyes. Uh, you're not going to hypnotise me, are you? I refuse to be Elvis. No, we're just going to have a nice little matter to take your mind off the ground below. Now, whatever you do, don't look down. I really wasn't going to. Oh, here we go. Now, what's your name? Uh, Raisin. Agatha Raisin. Oh, Raisin. Is that as in dried fruit? Yes. Uh, what's your name? Ella. Ella Payne. Oh, as in a dull ache. So what brings you to this part of the world, then? I'd really rather not talk about it, thank you. Well, then, I'll tell you what I'm here for, shall I? If you must. I've come here on a bit of a pilgrimage. You see, I'm looking for the Gracie Fields Museum. For what? Gracie Fields Museum. She spent her final days here, you know. Really? Are, are you sure? Oh, yes. Do you like our Gracie? I can honestly say I've never given it a minute's thought. Oh, I love her. She's got a voice that just cuts through you. Wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. Cheerio, here I go on my Ella, way. Ella, 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 please. I know you're only doing this to take my mind off the rocks down below, but right now plunging to my death is almost preferable. Oh, really? No one's ever spoken to me like that before. Possibly because you've never let them get a word in edgeways. Oh, oh. Come on now, Ellen. Oh. Don't upset yourself. <laughs> Mrs. Raisin's just in a bit of a state. Oh. Would you like me to sit with you, Mrs. Raisin? Oh, please. Here, take my hands. Uh, look, we're nearly there. There's a beautiful blue sky, and the town looks as though it's carved out of marble. Yes. And the sea looks absolutely... Oh, oh. oh. sorry, mustn't look down. Well, that wasn't as bad as all that. My goodness, your palms are all sweaty. You say the nicest things. 
Right. Well, let's go for a walk, shall we? I think we could all do with a bit of fresh air. Mrs. Raisin. Sam, I'm so sorry if I upset your wife. Oh, no harm done. She means well, does Ella, but she does like a chat. That's one way of putting it. I know she goes on a bit, but she's got a heart of gold. Yes. Sadly, mine is made of much baser metal. So, what brings you here, if you don't mind me asking? Well, if you must know, I came here looking for someone. I thought as much. Really? Yes. You look like someone who's lost a shilling and found a sixpence. Is it that obvious? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Look at the sea. It's sort of, um, shimmering. It's much nicer when you're not dangling over it. So, what's his name? His name? Oh, it's... James? Oh, James! What's got into her? I've no idea. I think she's found what she came here looking for. Oh, yes, just look at her go, running round like a blue-nosed fly. I feel sorry for that poor man. You'd think he'd be safe from a riding halfway up a cliff. Bonjour, monsieur. Uh, uh, yeah, bonjour. Excusez-moi. Is this a possible pour utiliser votre uh, WC? Uh, oui, monsieur. C'est la bas. Oh, uh, grazie. I mean, I mean, merci, monsieur. Bonjour, madame. Oh, um, hello. Uh, excuse me. Did a man just come in here? Grey hair, blue eyes and a guilty look on his face. Ah, madame, vous devez attendre votre cigarette. What? Défense de fumée. Oh, um, I get you now. Sorry. When I learned French, we didn't have anti-smoking fanatics. Madame, je ne parle pas l'anglais. Well, I'm sure you do when no one's looking. Look, avez-vous vu un homme anglais avec les um, cheveux gris et les yeux bleus? Ah, l'anglais. Oui, il est aux toilettes. I thought so. James, the man is going to have to close for lunch eventually. I mean, he has been open for over five minutes. Oh, Agatha. I thought if I hid in a locked room on a remote mountain on a faraway island, I might finally get away from you. Well, you thought wrong. We need to talk. I know you're already arguing with the staff. You told me to get rid of my cigarette. I mean, if the French won't stand up for smokers, then what is the point of them? Agatha, this island has survived invasion from the Phoenicians, the Greeks and the Etruscans, but I think it's finally met its match. Can we continue this discussion somewhere else? Oh, well, uh, I suppose you may as well come to my villa. It's right on the edge of a cliff. Agatha, do you have to bring those cats of sticks into my villa? I mean, is the pine fresh air just not good enough for you? Well, nothing so good that it can't be improved upon. Uh, well, um, go and sit by the window, will you? Uh, you'll get a wonderful view of a 600-foot drop. Fine. I'll try not to burn a hole in your sofa. Oh, they have a much lower standard of fireproofing on the continent, so when you go up like Joan of Arc, don't come running to me. Oh, look, the Mediterranean Sea. Still very blue? Yes, and very deep. Here, you can uh, use this Charlotte Church CD as an ashtray. It came free with the Daily Telegraph. So you're not short of home comforts? Far from it. I have broadband internet access. So if I'm at a loose end, I can always listen to the archers. Really? You could have saved a few quid and gone to Skegness. Agatha, I do know if you're aware, but this is one of the most historic parts of Europe. Lord Nelson lost his eye here, you know. And Napoleon's death mask is on display at the Hotel de Ville. Really? And yet people still go to Euro Disney. So, um, hmm. how exactly did you track me down? Oh, it wasn't hard. I went round all the car rental firms, pretended I was your dizzy wife, and said I'd lost the address of our villa. Yes, I did consider using a pseudonym. I was just about to sign my name as Colonel Mustard. So, um, how are you coping with the driving? I've more or less given up, which is a shame, because I was learning some very colourful French swear words. But I could never get used to being on the wrong side. Hmm. I'm amazed you didn't ask them to swap. James. Yes? Look, I know we'll never get back to the way things were, but can you at least understand why I did what I did? No, actually, I can't. Our wedding was supposed to be the happiest day of my life. And it turns out that you've got more skeletons in your closet than Dennis Nielsen. I wanted to marry you more than anything in the world. 
I knew that Jimmy was out there somewhere, but I thought he was dead or dying. I didn't expect he'd turn up at the wedding. I, I really didn't want it to end up like this. Well, then you should have confided in me about Jimmy. That's easier said than done, James. I mean, you're awfully good at facts and figures and statistics, but when it comes to emotions, well, you only show those every hundred years, like Halley's Comet. If it's Halley's Comet, that would be every 76 years. I rest my case. Agatha, to my mind, what you did was unforgivable. However, I have at least reached a point where I can sit with you here and the cliff just a few yards away and I have no desire to push you over it. Well, in some parts of the Middle East, that would be regarded as a peace settlement. Mm -hmm. Um. So, um, who were those people you were with? Oh, the usual mismatch of Brits abroad, all bonded by a common language and a hankering for Marmite. Oh, good Lord, I miss that. George and Olivia, that's the young couple. Well, he's a high-powered solicitor probably sent here by Nelson's grandchildren to sue for the missing eye. What about the other two? The sort of phosphorescent blonde of the man who looks like a scarecrow. Oh, that's Salmonella. Salmonella? <laughs> As in the intestinal food bacterium? Yes, they've heard all the rotten egg jokes. Oh, I'm surprised they married when it led to such an unfortunate pun. Well, some people do. In spite of all the obstacles. <sighs> yes, and, um... What brings them to Corsica? Well, Ella, but that's the bottle blonde, apparently came here to visit the Gracie Fields Museum. There isn't a Gracie Fields Museum. Oh, there must be. She was buried here. I think you'll find she died on the Isle of Capri. Did she? How do you know that? The fact has somehow inveigled its way into my subconscious. Sadly, the human brain doesn't come with a delete button. Well, she will be disappointed. She's torn out great handfuls of peroxide looking for it. Good Lord. The curse of the low-cost airline comes to Corsica. <laughs> I'd forgotten what a snob you were. Ordinary people do have a right to enjoy beautiful places. The woman came to an historic Mediterranean island in search of a Gracie Fields Museum. She deserves everything she gets. You must be at home here, with all the history. Hmm. The geography's rather impressive, too. Do you know there are more fjords here than in Norway? There are more canals in Birmingham than in Venice, but quantity isn't everything. I'm actually thinking I might uh, stay here, you know. Perhaps just keep a little pier out there in London. And leave the village? Yes. I mean, this place is perfect. Except for occasional unwanted visitors. James, I'm going to follow you wherever you go until we make peace. There's absolutely no point. I strongly suggest that you go your way and I will go mine. I don't want to, James. I want to be with you. Where am I going to go without you? Well, there's always the Gracie Fields Museum. Mrs. Raisin. What? Oh, Sam. Uh, sorry, I was miles away. Can I offer you a lift somewhere? But I was just waiting for the bus. Oh, no, I couldn't bear to think of you in a bus full of strangers. Here, come and hop in with us. Right, thanks. Hello, Mrs. Raisin. Did you manage to catch that man you were running after? Y yes. Um, we had a very pleasant afternoon. Well, that's more than we've managed. It seems we've been on a bit of a wild goose chase. I've come to the wrong island, you know. It's the other one Gracie died on, Capri. Yes, I realised that just as soon as I left you. Oh, well, never mind. Every cloud has a happy ending. And I have had a lovely holiday. This time last week, we were in Paris. Oh, the city of romance. That's right. We went to see where Princess Diana was killed. I was a big fan of hers, you know. She did such a lot for landmines and their victims. Oh, well, this conversation's taken a very cheerful turn. How are you finding the hotel, Mrs. Raisin? Well, it does what it says on the tin. They do fluff up the pillows every morning and fold the lavatory bed to a point. I wish they had some concept of air conditioning. Boiling in the daytime, but Olivia is having to knit cardigans for the night time. Hey, tell Agatha about the great bathroom disaster. I was trying to put that out of my mind. Oh, go on. Last night, the chap in the room above us flooded his bathroom. Water came pouring through our bedroom ceiling. It soaked all our things. So what do the hotel do? 
they offer us a couple of towels to dry the bed with. Oh, typical. Here, I know what we could do to cheer ourselves up. Yes? Why don't we put all our glad rags on and get on down to the hotel disco? Oh, the last time I set foot on a dance floor, I don't think they'd actually invented pop music. Well, then it's high time you got back there. You've got to keep up with the young people. Oh, one of the advantages of growing old is not having to have your ears blown off by appalling music. Now, Luke, I won't take no for an answer. I've been down in the dumps all afternoon, but tonight I'm stepping out and I'll be as happy as a pig in a pork. What do you wear to stand underneath a glitter ball? I don't even have a pair of white stilettos. Hello. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. Only me. Mrs. Bloxby, you have no idea how good it is to hear a friendly voice. Oh, well, I'm awfully glad I didn't put on my grumpy voice then. <laughs> how are things in the village? Oh, we are having such fun. Do you know, we're just in the middle of our Adopt a Granny Week. Oh, well, it's all happening there, isn't it? Yes, there were. Well, we did have a bit of a snag when we realised that there aren't many people in the village under the age of 60. <laughs> Must be something in the water. So um, quite a few of the grannies had to adopt each other. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I wish some mum would adopt me. Oh, dear. Still no sign of James, then? I have seen him and received a look which could have turned me to stone. Oh, Mrs Raisin, I'm so sorry. Though, there is one thing occurs to me. Oh, yes? I keep thinking if there was some kind of catastrophe, that could bring us together. Oh, dear. You're not thinking of another murder, are you? Well, no, but perhaps if there was flash flooding or a landslide near his villa. Mrs. Raisin, do be careful what you wish for. Sorry, just trying to take my mind off the ordeal I'm about to go through. Oh? What ordeal would that be? I'm about to go to the hotel disco. Goodness me! I would have thought that wasn't your sort of thing at all, really. Well, that's what you do on a Mediterranean island when you don't have a granny to adopt. Would you like a drink, Mrs. Raisin? Sorry? I said, would you like a drink? Fizzy water, please. Really? Nothing stronger? No, it wouldn't agree with the neurofen I'm having later. All right. Oh, I'll lend you an hand. I wouldn't want you doing someone a mischief, but with all these gyrates in bodies everywhere. Oh, oh, th thank you very much. Does anyone know there's a bathroom in this place? Yeah, it's over there, next to the fluorescent pyramid, under the inflatable elephant. Oh, right. We're back in two shakes. Mrs. Raisin? Yes? How did we get roped into this? I have no idea. You agreed to some strange things when you're being driven round a cliff. <laughs> what are you up to tomorrow? Probably getting my ears syringed. What do you think of them? Who? Mr and Mrs Payne. Oh, well, they mean well, I suppose. They just seem to follow us everywhere. George and I have started calling them the recurring pains. <laughs> Sam seems pleasant enough. Oh, I know. God knows what he's had to put up with. I'm going to see if George needs a hand. Can I just say something, Mrs. Raisin? Oh, didn't you find the bathroom? I just want to say, thanks for coming out with us. You're welcome. I know it's not your bag, but at least with you here, I don't feel quite so old. <laughs> you can go off people, you know. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't mean it like that. Sorry, no offence. I'm taken. Right, uh, Guinness for you. Oh, thanks very much. And a sparkling mineral water for you. Thank you. Has anyone seen you? I thought she was with you, George. No, uh, no, she, uh, disappeared to powder her nose. Oh, James Heath, that'll be for me. Uh, have you seen my Ella? No, should I have done? Oh, hold on a minute. Do you smell smoke? No, I don't think so. Darling, I think there's a fire over there. No, no, that isn't smoke, it's dry ice. People have much more fun if they feel they're dancing in a burning building. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, 100%. Oh, oh, oh. Actually, oh, oh. 99. <laughs> Interview commence 2300 hours. So, will you confirm that you are Mrs. Agatha Raisin? Yes, it is me, not my evil twin. You will please take this a little more seriously. Well, you can't be accusing me of arson. Although I suppose that's one way of getting them to turn the noise down. It is a little more serious than just arson. Well, it's not as if anyone died, did they? I mean, we all got out okay. Ella? What makes you think that Ella might not have escaped the fire? 
Well, I mean, she's the only one from our group that I haven't seen. Ah, yes, you are part of a group consisting of Olivia and George Debenham and Sam and Ella Payne. That's right. And were you with these people for the whole time? Well, I mean, they all popped out at some point in the evening. Look, please tell me what happened to Ella. Is she okay? Please. Mrs. Raisin, we may require you to remain on this island for several weeks. Do you have sufficient funds to stay here? Well, it's not exactly the cheapest place in the world. Though, um, I do have a friend who has a villa here. And will this friend be happy for you to stay with her? It's a he, actually, and I don't know if the word is, um, happy. Agatha, will I never be free? I mean, must I dig a tunnel into the bowels of the earth? Stop moaning and have Ooh. some brandy. Mm. It'll calm your nerves. Oh, thank you so much for opening my duty free. You're welcome. Bottoms up. I mean, what did I do in a previous life to be punished this way? Was I Mussolini? Or maybe Hitler? Well, you certainly weren't Beau oh. Brummel. I mean, those pyjamas have seen better days. Oh. Now, why don't you have a drink and calm down? I might not want a drink. Oh, and I may not choose to calm down. When I booked this villa, I asked for a sea view and internet access. I forgot to mention a moat and a, a pack of Rottweilers. All I'm asking is to curl up on your sofa for a few days. Well, thank you for using the correct possessive pronoun. It is my sofa. In my villa, booked by me, personally, on an island of my choosing. Yes, and where we were going to go for our honeymoon. But whose fault is it that went belly up? I mean... I was all ready to enter the marriage contract in good faith, but I'd assumed it would be an exclusive contract. Oh. I would have thought you might have managed just a little bit of sympathy, considering I'd just escaped from a burning building where a woman was murdered. How do you manage that, Agatha? I mean, they say you're never more than six feet away from a rat, but you're never more than six feet away from a dead body. And to think it's only a few hours since I was bitching about her hair dye. Oh, I feel dreadful now. Oh, uh, yes, you should only bitch about people with a good long lifespan. Anyway, at least she's closer to Gracie Fields now. Oh. They're probably sharing a cloud with Princess Diana. Any idea how the deed was done? Apparently, she was stabbed in the heart with a skewer or something oh, similar. Dear. And the killer then started a fire with a bottle of vodka and some curtains. Oh. As you said, there's a much lower standard of fireproofing on the continent. Well, there's only a population of 200,000, so it shouldn't take them too long to find the killer. James, you weren't seriously thinking of leaving it to the police, were you? Why ever not? Well, they're French. Oh, marvellous. When I mean, you can no longer abuse any other racial or minority group, at least we can always have a go at the Gaul. Well, there has to be some use for them. So do you propose the usual stirring up of hornets' nests and, and, and watching as everyone else gets stung? Oh, no. I can't possibly go talking to Ella's friends. They know me. Mm. They'll be as suspicious of me as I am of them. So who is going to lead your investigation? I'd have thought that's obvious. You are. Oh, oh. Agatha. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Olivia was played by Caroline Harker. Sam by George Layton and Mrs. Bloxby by Liza Sadovy. Ella by Julia Deakin. George by Spencer Banks and Jean-Pierre by Peter Silverleaf. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton. And the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 4, The Green-Eyed Monster. Morning, Agatha. Oh, hello. Well, yeah, there's one thing sets me up for the day. It's a three Bs. A bracing walk under blue skies followed by a big bowl of bran flakes. Really? I prefer the three Cs. Coffee, croissant and a cigarette. Right, well, open the window then, shall I? Well, if a seagull makes a dive towards your bran flakes, don't come running to me. Agatha, there is no such thing as a seagull. There are individual birds, such as the kitty wake, which are commonly called gulls, but the actual term seagull is itself meaningless. Do you seriously think that I give a toss? Well, if you use that term in front of an ornithologist, he might think you were some sort of idiot. That is a risk I am prepared to take. <sighs> and I notice you've helped yourself to my freshly laundered toweling robe. 
Oh, I hope you don't feel violated. No, but at the end of your stay, I shall send a bill for laundry and incidentals. It's so nice to feel welcome. Right. I think it's time for murder. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Three days ago, a young woman called Ella Payne was stabbed through the heart at a hotel disco. Young woman? The only thing young about her were her dentures and her hair dye. Compassionate as ever, Agatha. I'm amazed they didn't ask you to write her obituary. Anyway... She leaves behind her husband, Sam, apparently of independent means. A rather nice salt-of-the-earth Yorkshireman, hand-carved in God's own county. Also in the hotel disco were George and Olivia Debenham. He's a high-class solicitor. Not quite sure why they became friends with Sam and Ella. Well, British people do that on holiday. They gather round the hotel pool and exchange copies of the Daily Mail and PG Tips tea bags. Yes. Do you think we could find out a bit more about their backgrounds? No. Well. We could try getting in touch with Bill Wong. Do you have his phone number? No. Oh, perhaps he's on the internet. Oh, he's bound to be. Probably got his own website. BillWong.com Crime Prevention and Herbal Medicine. I could oh. phone Mrs. Bloxby. She probably knows it. Fine, you do that. One other thing that's bothering me. Yeah? How did the killer get rid of the murder weapon? Well, you may not have noticed, but we are actually entirely surrounded by water, and the Mediterranean is uh, awfully deep. There was a fire at the disco, presumably caused by the killer as a distraction, and then we all got ushered out into a courtyard. No one was allowed to leave. And then the police sent us to our rooms until they were ready to question us. Where presumably the killer hid the blade, or whatever it was, under the bed. James. The police searched our rooms and took away every sharp object, presumably for DNA testing. Mm. They even took away some plastic chopsticks I'd had with a takeaway. Oh, so glad you're trying all the authentic local cuisine. Well, where did our weapon go? Uh, perhaps the killer has a secret career as a sword swallower. <laughs> don't be facetious. Mm. Well, you'll have to admit, we don't have a great deal to go on. Well, let's go to the hotel and get some more. Agatha, I have not yet shaved, and I shall have two-thirds of my bran flakes. Well, you can get some more at the hotel. Just don't let them put any garlic on it. Can I get you anything else to drink, sir, madame? Oh, if I could have some more tea. Uh, but, but this time, if you could see that the tea bag goes in first, and then the boiling water, it, it makes so much more sense than just bringing me all the ingredients separately. Oh, would you like me to get the manager? Oh, no, no. Just, just do your best. Thank you. James, there's really no point. It's like trying to teach road safety to a hedgehog. Well, not much in the papers about this murder. The usual stuff about loving wife, devoted husband, is Corsica still safe for British holidaymakers? Uh, should we pull out of Europe? Is it time? They're sure to find some skeletons in the cupboards. Yes. This really used to be a five-star hotel. Apparently, in the far-off mists of time. Oh, five stars, my word. Of course, when a star collapses, it becomes a black hole. So, um, perhaps that should be a new form of rating for the most appalling hotels in the world. One black hole, two black holes, five black holes. Mm. <laughs> I blame the Brits myself, sitting there in their knee-length shorts, white ankle socks and sandals. It's enough to put anyone off their brioche. Well, that's one thing we still do very well. Ruining other people's countries. Oh, look, that's them. What? Who, who were? George and Olivia. They're the ones canoodling on the sun lounger. Ah. She's clinging to him like a limpet. Go and have a word. I I don't think it's your job to give me orders. Do you want to get off this island? More than anything else in the world. Well, go and talk to them. What about? I don't know how hard it is to get a decent cup of tea round here. Where are you going? I'm going to have a word with Sam, but I don't want them to see me. They know me. Oh, I'm um, right. Uh, your tea, sir. Oh, well done. Tea bag in the cup, water well above room temperature. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm just going to take it from this table over here to uh, that table over there. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to get rid of that moustache? Get rid of it? I thought it made me look rather dashy. <laughs> It makes you look like a Bond villain. Oh, really? Mm. Well, play your cards right. I might tell you my plans for world domination. <laughs> Hello. Uh, are you talking to me? Yes, you You look as if you're having a great deal of fun. Well, we were. Do you mind if I join in? What? I mean, do, do you mind if I join you? Uh, f fine. Be my guest. <laughs> uh, I was sitting over there by the shallow end, but, but several small children started smashing my daily mail. Uh, oh, have you got a mail? Can I borrow it? Oh, I'll leave it for you. I I'm almost done. Thanks. <laughs> Hang on. I'm 
sure I've seen your face somewhere before. Ah, well, well, I have had it an awfully long time. No, I'm sure. I never forget a face. Ah, well, you might just have seen it on the dust jacket of my book. Of course, I knew you were someone famous. Would you have written anything I've read? Uh, well, you might have read my book on the Peninsular War, The Iberian Experiment, Death in the Ranks from 1808 to 1814. Um, no, I don't think I have, actually. Have you, darling? No. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful hotel, this. Do you think so? <laughs> Some people are more easily pleased than others. Indeed, I mean, the mock Byzantine facade of this swimming pool is really something to behold. A pity the walls are paper thin and everything leaks. Well, does it? Oh, yes. A few days ago, our room was totally flooded. Oh. The chap above us had fallen asleep in his bath. Well, well, I hope they gave you an upgrade. Oh, no. But I can assure you the matter will be reflected in our bill. Uh, well, of course, I mean, it can't do much for their reputation having a murder here. Murder? Oh, oh yes, you mean here, on, um, on page 27 of the Daily Mail. Uh, well, you must have heard of it. Oh, yes, yes. Sorry, I was dreaming. Uh, I mean, did you know the murdered lady? Only as well as we know you. Oh, well, she seemed like a very nice woman and such a terrible waste. Mm. I can't help wondering about that husband of hers. Mm. Terrible temper he had. Oh, really? Well, according to the Mail, friends describe him as... Um, a perfect husband, a devoted, loyal and caring. Yes, that's exactly how he comes across at first. Mm. But still waters run deep. Hold on. Just coming. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, thanks for coming to see me. Sam, it's Agatha, please. Come in, come in. Thank you. Are you keeping? Oh, you know, still in a bit of a haze. I can imagine. When you've lived with someone for 35 years, you, you can't quite believe they're gone. I just took my jacket off and I could hear Ella's voice telling me, hang it up properly, don't just stick it on the chair. It takes an awfully long time to adjust. I know. Oh, have a seat. Here, you can sit on the bed. Right. Sam, I do hope I'm not invading your privacy. Oh, don't be daft. I'm just glad that someone can still look me in the eye. Oh, dear. I'm afraid that's par for the course with an unsolved murder. Tongues will wag. Oh, poor Ella. I just wouldn't want to go the way she went. Sam, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's all right. It seems to hit me the worst at this time in the evening. Yes. Can I ask you a favour? Of course, anything. You wouldn't fancy a game of Scrabble with me. Scrabble? Me and Anna always used to play about ten o'clock, just before bedtime. Well, um, I'm, I'm not terribly good. Oh, it doesn't matter. I just want to take my mind away from dark thoughts. Of course I'll play. Oh, thanks. I really should phone my friend, though, and say I'm running a bit late. Well, that's all right. Y you can use the phone by the bed. Thanks. James, I'm with Sam at the moment. Not quite sure when I'll be back, but don't worry. And, oh, I'll, I'll see you when I see you. Come and sit over here. Oh, um, don't you want the board a bit closer? No, you're all right. I'm actually long-sighted. I'm not sure if I can remember how to play. There's not much to it. Just take seven letters. One, five, six. Seven. Well, don't expect any seven-letter words. I'll probably play a lot of cat and dog and the. <laughs> oh, my Ella was a wonderful one for words. Had a good vocabulary, did she? No, she just made them up. I remember once she tried to play the word hencroach. Encroach? No, hencroach. She insisted it was a female cockroach. <laughs> oh, and she swore blind that the Christmas holidays could sometimes be referred to as the wintering period. Oh! I think she deserved marks for nerve. All right. I've got a word. Have you? Yes. Uh, learner. L-E-A-R-N-E-R. -E hey, that's not bad. You've got an L on the double letter, E on a double word. That's 16 points. And a 50-point bonus. Well, hey, not bad for a beginner. <laughs> no. You know, if you want to spend the night here, you're more than welcome. Oh, well... Uh, this, this is a suite, you see. There's an extra bed next door. Really? Yes, me and Ella had separate beds on account of my little problem. Problem? Snoring. 
I'm afraid I snore like a brain donkey. Oh, I see. I've tried everything. Homeopathy, eucalyptus on the pillow. And, um, how did you feel when Ella shared her bed with other men? Who told you about that? Uh, no, no one told me. Just female intuition. Oh, all right. So long as he never told you. <laughs> Too much of a gentleman. George. That's right. I couldn't bear the thought of him bragging about it. No, he never mentioned it. But I did notice a certain chemistry when I saw them together at the disco. Yeah, I think it all started the day before that. We were on the beach and I was chatting with Olivia. And I noticed George and Ella were gone for just a bit longer than they should have. Yes, but that doesn't prove anything. Oh, you can tell. When it happens a lot, you can tell. I think they went into the woods. I found quite a few pine needles in the carpet that night. Sam, you do seem very calm about all this. Well, there's no point getting upset about human nature. Ella was beautiful, and she was full of joy. Sometimes she just wanted to share that joy with other people. Yes, but how did that make you feel? I was all right about it. In some ways, it made me feel special. Special? How do you mean? Well, the thing is, no matter what she did, she'd always come back to me. Who's, who's there? James, it's only me. So you've not been murdered, then? No, but thank you so much for your concern. What time is it? Well, judging by the sound of the bats, I'd say it's three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock? How did you get back here? I took a taxi round the mountain. It would have been cheaper to actually buy the mountain. Well, this is turning into a very expensive trip. I do hope you've enough for your half of the bill. Yes, James, and when we get back to England, I will owe you nothing. Uh, what on earth are you up to now? I'm going to make a strong black coffee. Oh, great, so that you can stay awake all night. Good idea. I'm not going to drink it. I'm just going to wrap my hands round it. Oh. I need a little bit of warmth from somewhere. Uh, I was actually rather worried about you. Really? Well, that would explain why you were curled up asleep on the sofa. I said I was worried. I didn't say I was distraught. No, I can't imagine anything upsetting your well-ordered world. And when this mess is cleared up, hopefully I won't be part of it anymore. Oh, well, roll on that glorious day, then. Fine. <clears throat> so, solved any interesting sudokus while I've been gone? No. As a matter of fact, I've been for a meal with George and Olivia. A meal? I said you should talk to them, not start a menage a trois. They're actually rather charming. Olivia records talking books for the blind, you know. She's just made a 24-hour recording of Moby Dick. And she's promised to have a look at my Napoleonic Wars manuscript. Well, that'll make Moby Dick seem like a fish finger. <laughs> still, even if they're blind, they can still find the off switch. Anyway, they're obviously very much in love. There was a great deal of kissing and canoodling throughout the evening. <laughs> Goodness, that must have been embarrassing for you. <sighs> of course, you know that was all a front. What do you mean? Oh, come off it, James. You've seen disgraced politicians molesting their wives in front of five bar gates. <sighs> They're putting on a very public display of affection to paper over the cracks. Agatha, why do you always have to believe the worst in people? You seem obsessed with digging up dirt, spreading gossip and innuendo, dragging everything down to the lowest common denominator. And are you actually going to make that coffee? I have it on very good authority that George was having an affair with Ella. Oh, really? Says who? Sam told me. Oh, he did, did he? Is that what you were discussing? Amongst other things. Anyway, I don't think it's any of your business. Agatha, I mean, how do you think it looks to the police? He's just lost his wife, and then you waltz off with him until the small hours. Well, nothing happened. We just sat up playing Scrabble. Oh, really? And how many points do you get for floozy on a triple word score? James! Are you jealous? Uh, uh, I'm just concerned you may be compromising your own investigation. Typical. You say you want nothing to do with me, but as soon as you think I've been with someone else, you suddenly go all green-eyed. That is not the case. I just prefer it if you didn't dangle your daily dalliances in front of my face. And there was me saying you were like Halley's Comet, only feeling emotion every 76 years. Mm, I've been thinking about that, and I've decided Halley's Comet is not a very good metaphor for emotion, as it's composed largely of ice. In your case, that is extremely appropriate. <sighs> I'm off to bed. Fine. I'm going to stay up and watch some television. Well, you'll be rather annoyed to find that everything's in French. Very inconsiderate of them, I know. They do have a couple of English programmes, but they dub them. I don't care. I just want something to take my mind off. Well, 
take my mind off everything, really. Well, don't have it too loud, please. I would quite like a bit of shut eye. Don't worry. I won't disturb your sweet dreams of the day before you met me. Ça se pose un problème. What oh, earth you watching? EastEnders. Good Lord. Who would have thought the Mitchell brothers were bilingual? <laughs> I love. Yes, I still do occasionally. Good Lord. <laughs> I thought that was one of those sounds you wouldn't hear again, like the song of a nightingale or the UK theme on Radio 4. <laughs> James. Yes? I know I've messed everything up, but why did we actually think we were right for each other in the first place? I don't know, really. It was just a... a certain spark. Sometimes several thousand volts. The thing is, we seem to argue constantly. We've got nothing in common except a strange tendency to stumble over dead bodies. Yes. Well, water under the bridge now. No point crying over us. You have email. What was that? Oh, that was my computer. What? Think I had a woman hiding under the bed? Oh, look, it's from Bill Wong. But it's three o'clock in the morning. Only two o'clock over there. He'll be just about turning in. Well, what does he want? Background checks on our three main suspects. Sam Payne, formerly a hill farmer in North Yorkshire, moved to Leeds and became a care assistant. No criminal record. Olivia Debenham, formerly a district nurse. A nurse? Yes, that's right. So she would know exactly how to kill someone with a single stab wound. Agatha, I know the NHS isn't what it was, but they're not all multiple murderers. But you've got to admit, it is interesting. Well, I'm sure hill farmers are a fairly dangerous bunch. I mean, if they can wrestle with 200 terrifying sheep... I just wish I knew how she got rid of her weapon. Well, perhaps she cunningly put someone's arm in a sling and hid it in the bandages. James. A few days ago, when George and Olivia were out together, they hardly made eye contact. Now his tongue is so far down her throat, she'll have to call a dino rod. Oh, thank you so much for that image. Well, it wouldn't do any harm just to have a quiet word with Olivia. Yes, it would. If you're wrong, you could end up looking a complete idiot, and if you're right, you could end up at the bottom of a cliff. Somehow or other, I'm going to make her confess. <laughs> And how are you going to do that, then? Shine a bright light in her eyes, or, or are you going for the old thumb screws? The usual method. I shall scare her with a mixture of innuendo and barefaced lies. Oh, well, stick to what you're good at. I get the feeling I'm on my own with this one. Oh, Agatha. Much as I feel I owe you nothing, I would feel a certain twinge of guilt if I should have to find your body on the beach. So, as always, I shall be twenty paces behind you, like the Duke of Edinburgh listening in on my mobile phone. Well, it's wonderful weather out. I know that. I can see it in front of me. Fancy a stroll down the beach with me? Not particularly. Darling, what exactly is it? What's what? Well, you've started flirting like a teenager with me in public, and then you tear me to pieces in private. Do I? And the penny hasn't dropped yet? Obviously not. You don't think it might be to do with your affair with Ella? And the one before that? And the one before that? Well, affair seems to be overstating it. It was just a bit of fun. And the poor woman's dead now, so why are you so angry? I am angry because we can't get off this wretched island. You're a solicitor. Can't you get them to move things along? I'm also a potential suspect. If I try and interfere, it doesn't look good. We just have to leave it to the police. And the sooner they find whatever maniac did it, the better. Fine. So we get to stew in our juices for God knows how long. Why did we have to holiday on an island? I think you'll find every landmass on Earth is surrounded by water. Unless you think we should holiday on another planet. That does it. I'm going for a walk. I thought you said you didn't want one. No, I said I didn't want to walk with you. Mrs Raisin. Oh, oh, um, hello, Olivia. Have you been listening at my door? Uh, no, no, I, I, I seem to have mislaid a contact lens. I didn't know you wore them. Yes, it's vanity, I'm afraid. Right. Oh, well, no sign of them. That's another expensive trip to the opticians, if we ever get out of here. Yes. Look, um, there's a little balcony just round the corner, overlooking the bay. Have, have you got time for a chair? Oh, um, uh, yes, yes, why ever not? Oh, the chairs are a bit wet. I think it must have rained in the night. Oh, it's not too bad. Just a little damp. Well, you don't want to ruin your cardigan. That's all right. It's just an old thing. Oh, funny. I could have sworn you were still making it when we first met. I seem to remember you always carried a bag of knitting round with you. That was a different cardigan. Oh, yes. 
I wish I had the talent. I could never get the knack. Knit one, pearl one, cast off. So, Mrs. Raisin, what is your talent? Oh, I see myself as a people person. I often find complete strangers opening up to me, almost as if they're in the psychiatrist's chair. Well, you should charge the professional rate. You'd be made for life. Ella told me a great deal. Mostly about how fond she was of your husband and how he was getting extremely close to her. <laughs> yes, the woman did have a capacity for fantasy. Oh, it's not fantasy. I saw them dancing at the hotel disco. You couldn't get a cigarette paper between them. And when they disappeared for a round of drinks, you just happened to follow. And you saw them in the cloakroom having a furtive fumble. Oh, it wouldn't have mattered too much. Only it was the latest in a long line of flings. And when your husband goes off with a trollop like that, it doesn't exactly reflect well on you. <laughs> Mrs. Raisin, I can see you're becoming quite feverish. It must be hard for you breaking up with that man you've been chasing all over the island. But just because you're frustrated, there's no need to invent lies about my husband. Oh, it's a lie, is it? A lie that you sent George away, then began to give Ella a piece of your mind. Only she just wouldn't be told. She stood up to you, told you exactly why your husband had started to stray. <laughs> Mrs. Raisin, I can remember the night in question, and I was out of your sight for barely a minute. Oh, it was a bit longer than that. Just long enough to take a knitting needle out of your handbag and give Ella the fatal wound. I would have thought it was impossible with a knitting needle, but you were clearly on fire that night. Oh, yes, the fire. Was that my doing as well? Yes. A bottle of vodka makes a very fine Molotov cocktail. Then you nip back, you join us, just before the fire really takes hold. Oh, well, it's nice to know what's going on in your head while you're sitting alone by the swimming pool. And I thought you were just drooling over the lifeguard. But there's one slight flaw in your story. The police never found a murder weapon, which makes me think that the killer got away, headed for the hills, before the fire was even discovered. I thought that too. But then I remembered, the day before it all took place, your room was flooded. Probably peeled off some of the wallpaper, dislodged a few ceiling tiles. Either way, it would have given you quite a few hidey holes when the police searched our rooms. And is this weapon still in my room? No, it's at the bottom of the deep blue sea. But I'm sure it's left a little trace, and the police would be very keen to investigate. What is it that you want, Mrs. Raisin? Is it money you're after? Because my husband has very deep pockets, and he owes me more than a few favours. He took me on this holiday to say sorry for his affairs. But he was back to his old ways the moment the plane landed. I understand how you feel. Oh, no, you don't. You were lucky enough to be born ugly. You don't have to worry about your looks fading. You don't know what it's like to be a dutiful wife, to give up your career, give up everything. While he got to play golf and, and play around, I got to be the trophy, stuck at home. But I didn't mind, because I thought that one day he'd be grateful. But he wasn't capable of gratitude, any more than he was capable of keeping his flies done up. But you didn't have to kill for it. When I killed Ella... I was killing every woman who's ever lured a man away from his wife. I used to forgive and forget. And when I was younger, I just thought of it as George sowing his wild oats. And then I thought of it as George trying to hold on to his rapidly receding youth. And then I stopped looking for excuses. I thought I'd married a prince. But he turned out to be a snivelling, disgusting toad. Olivia, I'm sorry for everything you've been through. And the court will have some sympathy. It's what the French call a crime of passion. Only you've got to tell the truth. You've got to save Sam, the agony of not knowing. Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Your little moment of girl's own glory. Brave Agatha of the Upper Six solves the mystery when police were baffled. But... I'm not going to give you the satisfaction. I'm not going through any more public humiliation. Olivia, no! Agatha. She jumped off the balcony. Did she land in one piece? Yes, we've got to get after her. Well, well the garden's all fenced off. Where's she going to go? I have a horrible feeling she's heading straight for the sea. Well, looks like she's still in one piece. Yes. And I hope for your sake she's well enough to stand trial. Well, it didn't look good when they put her in the air ambulance. She was about as blue as the Mediterranean. What do you think she was trying to do? 
What do you mean? I mean was, she, was she trying to commit suicide? She was just trying to get away, which is what you do when you've tried everything else. Yes, well, we're only 20 miles from Sardinia. Who knows? She might have made it if she didn't freeze to death in the process. Yes. It's not that warm out here, either. I need to go and get a cardigan. More than that, you need a new hobby. One that doesn't involve putting people's lives in danger. May I suggest sticking seashells onto jam jars? Look, will you please stop scolding me? I'm going to get enough of that from the police later. Fine. Well, then you can be told off in two different languages. James. Yes? I know you're keen to get back to the Daily Telegraph, but I did come all this way in the hope of getting a few answers. Agatha, we've talked and talked until we're blue in the face. I still need to know, James. Is this the end of the road, or is there something more for us round the corner? Agatha, for the past three weeks, I've been trying very hard to forget about our wedding day and its somewhat unfortunate ending. You and me both. But now I've decided. I'm rather grateful to Jimmy Raisin. What do you mean by that? Well, thanks to him, I had to endure a few months of misery. Whereas if the wedding had gone ahead, I might have faced a lifetime. Thank you, James. That's that cleared up. Where are you going? Frankly, I neither know nor care. Ibiza, Mallorca, Kathmandu, anywhere in the world where I won't meet you. <laughs> In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Olivia was played by Caroline Harker, Sam by George Layton, and George by Spencer Banks. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple, and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 5, The Fairies of Fryfam. Uh, OK, ladies, now, everybody find a space. No, not too close to each other. We don't want any more black eyes now, do we? <laughs> right. Thank you, Mrs Asquith. Very good. Now, we'll start off with some simple stretches... So if we all pretend to be sunflowers... Oh, I see the, the sun is quite low in the sky, Mrs. Backshot. Yes, that's better. Oh, hold on, sorry. Just pretend there's a, a solar eclipse for a minute, will you? Mrs. Bloxby, um, are you busy? Oh, well, I'm actually doing my keep fit for the over 50s. Oh, that's all right, then. They'll be glad to take the weight off their hip replacements. Oh. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask your advice on something. Oh, well, um, fire away. I was hoping to get away for a few days. Oh, that's nice. Uh, are you going anywhere special? That's the thing. I'm not sure where I want to go. I just need to get away from James. Oh, dear. Ever since we got back from Corsica, I've been having to avoid eye contact with him, which isn't easy when you live next door and Chivers keeps climbing into his garden. Well, where are you going? I've no idea. Anywhere, I won't be reminded of him. Somewhere that doesn't contain any of the letters in James Lacey. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> well, that does make it a little awkward. I mean, you can't go to Jarrow. <laughs> Obviously, you couldn't go to Minehead and um, uh, Slough is quite out of the question. Mrs. Blotchby, <laughs> I'm depressed. I'm not suicidal. And, and then there's A and E. They're very common vowels. And we do like a nice vowel sound in the middle of our English place names. Look, look it's not that important. I just want to go somewhere a little bit brighter. Somewhere... With a bit more sunshine. Oh, well, uh, of course, you, you could go to the southwest, maybe Cornwall. Cornwall, yes. I could rent a little cottage there by the sea. Truro, yes, that's it. No J, no A, no M, <laughs> no yes, E. Yes, I was thinking more of a village. Oh, oh, I see. Well, how long were you thinking of going away for? I don't really know. I was just going to rent a cottage and stay there till I got fed up. Oh, well, aren't you going to miss all the fun we have here, the ladies' society, cream teas? Mrs. Bloxby, I think the Cornish have some idea how to make a cream tea, but I could always take one of your recipes. And won't you be terribly lonely? 
away from all your friends? Well, I can always make some new ones. I mean, all it takes is a warm smile and a bit of self-confidence. So I says to him, be my guest. But you wouldn't put it in your mouth if you knew where it'd be. <laughs> Good evening. Is there something wrong with the acoustics? I'm sure I said that out loud. Evening, my love. What can I get you? Um, what, what sort of wine do you have? Wine? Oh, I'll just have a look. Now, let's see. We got red and we got white. Goodness, my cup runneth over. I think I'll have the red. Right. Just go and look for the corkscrew. You're not from round here, are you? No, if I was, I think you'd have noticed me by now. Oh, you'll be the one who's moved into Samfoyer Cottage. That's right, Mrs. Raisin. Huh? Agatha Raisin. Oh, is there a Mr. Raisin living with you? <laughs> no, it's just me and a cat called Chivers. Well, if you're ever in need of a bit of company... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be that needy. Yeah. You're not one of them lesbians, are you? Well, if you're the alternative, I might consider... Don't you worry about them, my love. You have your wine. Thank you. Uh, cheers. Uh, do you by any chance serve meals? Oh, now, if you want food, I think you've come the wrong time of year. Don't tell me you only eat between May and September. Look, I've just driven over 200 miles. Well, not much we can do about that. If you keep on driving, you're sure to bump into Rick Stein. <laughs> I see. Well, do you at least have a broom? Why? Whatever for? So you can sweep out my emaciated corpse? <sighs> well, I don't normally do this, but it just so happens I've got a bit left over from my supper. So if you'd like to follow me... Oh, we've got a right one here. I heard that. Really? Well, sit yourself down there, will you? Oh, thanks. I'll see what Mother's left in the arger. Uh, how much was the wine? Oh, let's call it a pound, shall we? A pound? Have I suddenly stepped back in time to the 1970s? Oh, well, that bottle's probably been sitting there for about 35 years. <laughs> there we are. Oh, it's, um... Chicken tikka masala. Well, what were you expecting? Starry gazy pie. I won't eat anything if it's looking at me. This is delicious. Uh, how much do I owe you? Oh, I wouldn't hear Teller charging you for that. Anyway, I reckon you need a bit of looking after. What with your broken heart? My what? Well, there has to be a reason you come down here in the dead of winter. Just as all our other visitors are heading back to London. Mm. Well, it's nothing a few days of sea air won't cure. Right, well, I'll leave you to it. Oh, hang on, Mrs... Uh, uh, Wendy, Wendy Wilder. Wendy, uh, there's something I wanted to ask you. Oh, eh? Uh? When I was driving into the village, I saw some strange lights in the hedgerow, almost as if they were fairy lights, but when I got closer, I couldn't see them. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Reckon you must have been tired after your long journey. Tiredness doesn't usually make me hallucinate. I just wondered if it was some local phenomenon. Oh, I don't think so. It's not as if we're living in fairyland now, is it? Now, if you'll forgive me, I've got customers to attend to. Um, thanks for the dinner. Don't mention it. Oh, Chivers, why did we ever come here? All the men look as though they've been carved out of driftwood. And then there's the lovely Wendy. Only she wasn't quite so lovely when I started asking her questions. What is it? What are you staring at? Chivers, there's something weird about this place, isn't there? You can feel it too. No, Cedric, I need you here tomorrow to photograph Crabtree Cottage for the next brochure. Excuse me. Uh, take a seat. No, it has to be tomorrow. Because I mm. want to show the cottage in a woodland setting. And they're chopping down all the trees on Wednesday. Yeah, right, see you then. Uh, Mr. Popplewell? Oh, uh, you're, um... Agatha Raisin. Ah, oh, Mrs. Raisin, of course. <laughs> and how are you settling in the Sunfire Cottage? I am just on the brink of settling out. It said in the brochure it was a picture postcard cottage. Now, what sort of a postcard would that be? One of the completely black ones that say Cornwall by night? Yes, there is a slight problem with the electric. Can I get you a coffee? No, thank you. If your idea of coffee is anything like your idea of a deluxe bathroom, you'll bring me a cup of pond water. Yes, well, it can be quite hard bringing period properties up to modern standards. I would have thought walls that went all the way up to the ceiling would be a minimum requirement. 
I'm fed up with having to rescue my cat from various nooks and crannies. Mrs. Raisin, I don't think you said anything about cats when you signed the agreement. Well, you didn't say anything about rats, but so far Chivers has caught seven. Well, I'll send someone round on Monday then, shall I? No, you'll send someone round tomorrow. I will be coming back from church at 12 o'clock and I expect to find a light bulb in every socket and polyfiller in every crack. Fine, Mrs. Raisin. I shall make your cracks my number one priority. I want it done within 24 hours and if it isn't, I'll report you to whoever's in charge of estate agents. I don't know who that is. Satan, probably. Of course, Mrs. Raisin. A customer is always right. Ah, Mrs. Raisin, how how very nice to see a newcomer at our little church. Yes, though I'm not sure how long I'll be staying. Oh, and uh, which church do you normally attend? Oh, no, I'm not a regular churchgoer. There's just so little to do round here. Uh Oh. Oh, um, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. No offence. None taken. Oh, dear. Charlie, do we really need to go to the wretched place? It's always such a bore. You have to consider my place in the community. There are prizes to be awarded, babies to kiss. Oh, honestly. Oops. Oh. Oh. I'm so sorry. I didn't see you there. Oh. Well, I was trying to have a discreet cigarette. Oh, well, I have no sympathy at all, then. Tolly used to do that. Terrible habit. Tolly? That'll be me. Tolly Danvers. At your service. And I'm Lucy. I'm Mrs. Raisin. Agatha Raisin. Are you from somewhere civilised, Mrs. Raisin? Where they have sushi and cocktail bars? (sighs) I'm from the Cotswolds, actually. A bit like this, only not quite so wet. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) never mind. I was hoping to catch up on a bit of London gossip. Tell you what, though, uh, do you fancy joining us for tea this afternoon? Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> it's either that or another trudge across the beach. <laughs> well, that settles it, then. Earl Grey and cucumber sandwiches with the crust cut off. Lovely. Uh, whereabouts do you live? Uh, we live in the lighthouse. Oh. Uh, uh, where's that? Um, that would be the large white building on top of the cliff. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that lighthouse. <laughs> you really are a bit of a country bumpkin, aren't you? The lighthouse. Well, it certainly does what it says on the tin. Though why would anyone want to live here? Oh, the things people do to show they've got money. You might just as well nail a £50 note to your figure. Ah, Mrs. Raisin, welcome to our humble abode. Come in. Thank you. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, I've just poured your tea. That was good timing. Oh, no. We can see you coming up the hill, you see. (laughs) So we do get ten minutes warning. Yes, you do have the most wonderful views up here. Oh, yes. If you look out of this window, you can see towards France and over here, the east coast of Ireland. On a clear day, you can even hear the Reverend Ian Paisley. Well, thank heavens it's cloudy. (laughs) How did you come to live in a place like this? Oh, uh, I'm a lottery winner. Eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirty-eight, forty-two. Really? No, I'm just joshing. Though the lottery folks did help me set up my business. Oh, Uh, What business would that be? Boytoys.com. Oh, dear. What, I shudder to ask, is that? Oh, you know, gadgets and gizmos for sad blokes and weirdos. Uh. Remote control cars, robots that scratch your testicles, that sort of thing. But, as you can see, there's gold in them. There are testicles. Here's your tea. Uh, I don't know if you take sugar or not. No, thanks. So... How are you finding Sunfire Cottage? Well, if they'd advertised it as an assault course, I'd be very pleased. (laughs) There are potholes in every room, and several stairs have collapsed underneath me. Ah, well, that's old man Popperwell for you. He's planning to sell the place off next month. Well, you'd think he'd want to improve it then. Oh, no, no, no. It's all for the wrecking ball. He's putting up 16 executive flats, which I'm not at all happy about. I'll show you the plans if you like. I'm thinking of leading a campaign against it. But he can't do that. It's a period property. I'm afraid as chair of the parish council, he can do exactly what he wants. That man would sell his granny to the zoo if he hadn't already turned her into dog food. You wouldn't believe the things that go on in this hellhole. Yes. Oh, and there's something I wanted to ask you. Oh, yes. When I first arrived here, I'm sure I saw some lights in the bushes near the cottage. At first I thought it must be some sort of animal, but no one in the village wants to talk about it. I mean, what's going on? Is your twin town Chernobyl? (laughs) (laughs) That'll be the Piskies. The what? 
pixies or fairies or whatever, the locals don't like to talk about them in case they come across as a bunch of inbred halfwits. Oh, but they can't seriously believe in fairies. Oh, you don't know what it's like here. It's so dreary and bleak and windswept and hideous. I mean, when you've spent a whole winter here, you'll believe in fairies. Right. Well, uh, I'll take Mrs. Raisin upstairs for a bit, shall I? Uh, just leave your cap there. But it'll get cold. Well, you can make a fresh pot then, can't you? Come on. You don't have an artificial hip, do you, Mrs. Raisin? No. Why? By the time you get to the top, you'll need one. Oh. <laughs> Keep up, Mrs. Raisin. Easier said than done. How many stairs are there? Only 59. Helps keep you fit. And it's worth it when you get to see this. Oh, my word. <laughs> this is where I come to think and to watch the sea swallowing up great chunks of the coastline. It is incredible. Oh, isn't it just? I come and sleep up here when Lucy's away. Just me and my hammock. When I first saw this place... I wondered how you could live anywhere so remote. Huh. Now I understand. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not remote from people. I'm just sort of hovering over them. I can see every house. The dog and duck, St. Catherine's by the weir. Sometimes I turn on the lamp and wink goodnight to them. <laughs> you must see the most wonderful sunsets. Oh, yes. And sunrises. The greatest show on earth. But it nearly always plays to empty houses. I notice your wife isn't quite so keen on living here. Oh, Lucy... She's just suffering withdrawal symptoms. She's off to London tomorrow for a few days shopping. She'll be much better after that. Oh, I see. A little bit of retail therapy? Yes. Though I prefer sea gale therapy. I'm going to open the windows. Listen to the waves come crashing by. Oh, it's just so humbling. It reminds me that however much money we make, however good we feel about ourselves, there's always a higher power. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. Are you on your own? Afraid so. Don't tell me my husband's abandoned you. Though well, he had a phone call from Los Angeles and I said I'd see myself out. Oh, that's Tolly for you. Dumps you as soon as he's got a better offer. Really? What exactly do you mean by that? Oh, nothing. But he can spend hours in that lamp room of his, playing with his boy toys. Oh, I'd have thought you'd be glad to get him out of your hair for a bit. Well, I would be there was anything at all to do around here. Mm, I know. It can be a bit bleak. Incidentally, did you smell anything strange in that room of his? Well, there was the smell of ozone from the sea. A sort of cheap perfume that seems to permeate the walls and the floor and all those appalling seafaring knickknacks. Now you come to mention it... I sometimes wonder if he's having an affair. Tolly? Oh, he doesn't seem the type. What, because he's too nice? Well, that's what some women go for. Especially the ones who buy their perfume at Pound Stretcher. Oh, well, I mustn't keep you. I'll show you to the door. Come on, Chivers. Eat your pilchards. Those trawler men risked life and limb to get them for you. Oh, who's that? Hello. Hello, Mrs. Raisin. It's only me. Mrs. Bloxby, this is a nice surprise. Well, I just thought I'd find out what the weather was like on the West Coast. Well, probably much the same as in Carsley. Maybe a little more windswept. Was there anything else? Well, to, to tell you the truth, we're all a bit worried about you. It's been over a week. Are you, are you settling in? Not really. You know I said you need self-confidence and a smile. Oh, yes? I remember the self-confidence, completely forgot the smile. Ah, well... <laughs> Give it time. Um, James has been asking after you. James? Uh, how is he? No, don't answer that. I came here to get away from him. Well, Mrs. Raisin, perhaps running away isn't the answer. I mean, you've been through so much, but he, he still does care for you. Perhaps if you could talk things through... Mrs. Bloxby, you haven't given him my address, have you? Um, well... Mrs. Bloxby... You really do need to sit down together. This isn't going to go away. But... Oh, hold on, I'm coming. Uh, look, I've really got to go. The phone's ringing. No, no, the phone can't be ringing since I'm on the other end of it. I, I mean the bell. Look, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Uh, I'm coming! Mrs. Race. Oh, 
Mr. Popplewell, it's you. Yes, indeed. Just coming to check that our improvements come up to your very high standards. Really? Not coming to knock the place down, then, with your little lump hammer? Who told you about that? A little bird told me. A bird who made his nest in a lighthouse. Oh, Tolly. Poor chap. He must have been a very troubled individual. What on earth do you mean by that? Haven't you heard? Tolly took his own life yesterday evening. Lucy, I came as soon as I heard. I still can't quite believe it. You and me both, Mrs. Rayson. You and me both. What happened? Well, um, <clears throat> no one quite knows yet. I was in London. I'd, I'd just spent a day shopping with my friend Ginny, and we'd gone to see a midnight movie, Bloodsuckers 3. Um, not my sort of thing, but Ginny loves that sort of nonsense. And you know the bit where the hero's tied to a chair and the villain's gouging his eyes out? Well, my mobile phone goes off. And, of course, you ignore it, but the whole cinema's staring at me, so I have to pick up. And I find out Tolly shot himself in the head. Someone was walking their dog and they heard. And all the time I'm being told this, I, I can see a man who's having his eyes sucked out by a vampire. Oh, Tolly. Did he leave a note? Uh, no. Apparently they don't always. Suicides. But I saw him two days ago. He seemed so cheerful. Well, that's Tolly. He did suffer from mood swings. Incredible highs, but some pretty bloody awful lows. But where did he get the gun from? I don't know. I mean, he did like to mix with a lot of hunting and shooting types. Though God knows what you'd hunt round here. Seagulls. Lucy, I hate to say this, but he didn't strike me as someone ready to meet his maker. Is there any possibility someone else got into the house? Well, no. I mean, look at this place. It's like Fort Knox. He died upstairs in the lamp room. I think he'd spent the day in the pub. The police say there were witnesses who saw him, and he seemed jolly enough, but then he came up here, climbed up 59 steps and shot himself. I can't bear to go up there. I keep thinking I'm going to see him lying there with his head blown off. Oh, Mrs. Rayson, it does strange things to you, this place. It does strange things. <laughs> So, now I know why I came to Cornwall. I didn't choose Fry Fam. It chose me. Afternoon, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, Wendy. I'm surprised to see you here. Oh, where's that then? Think I should be tied up behind the bar all day? Oh, no, it's not that. It's just... Oh, it does you good to come here. Take your mind off things. Yes. I don't think Fry Fam's the happiest place at the moment. Oh, I know. Poor Tolly. Everyone loved him. Hmm. And you were one of the very last people to see him. That's right. He stayed at the pub right till closing time. And, um, did he seem happy? Oh, I keep all my customers happy, Mrs. Raisin. I'm sure you do. But at the same time, there must have been something wrong with him. I mean, do you think there were any problems with his marriage? As I say, I keep my customers happy. And one of the things that makes them happy is I don't go blabbing all their secrets. No, sorry. I wasn't meaning to pry. I'm just amazed at what he did. Well, you keep your curiosity to yourself, Mrs. Raisin. We don't always take kindly to people interfering round here. Right. Oh, uh, by the way, did you know there's a strange man sitting outside your cottage? A man? That's right, about six foot two, blue-eyed, looking a bit bedraggled. Oh, dear. I think I know who that is. Well, I'd get straight to him if I were you. Looks like the ovens are just about to open. Lord. James! Uh, Agatha! James, what are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? I, I'm auditioning for the part of a garden gnome. Honestly. Look, uh, you may as well come inside. You sure? I mean, I could stay out here and test the relative absorbency of Harris Tweed. I could kill Mrs. Bloxby for giving you my address. Well, I, I would have found you anyway. How? Well, it was on the radio. There's been a mysterious death, and I thought, I bet that's the village where Agatha's staying. Did you come by train? Yes, that's right. I've got to see the rain in six different counties. Fine. 
Well, I'll give you a lift back to the station when you're ready. It's nothing like a nice West Country welcome, is there? James, I did actually come here to get away from you. If I'd have gone any further, I'd have ended up in the Atlantic. Look, after you left, I realised that I'd said quite a few unpleasant things to you. And you'd said one or two unfortunate things to me, but... Is it possible to, to forget the past? And could we pretend we're strangers, meeting for the first time? All right, then. Who are you? What are you doing in my cottage? Get out now, or I'll phone the police. Uh, well, hello, Chivers. Well, at least you're pleased to see me, but then cats are always a very good judge of character. Yes, and they're anyone's for a few scraps of smoked salmon. You can come through to the living room. Um, any possibility of a towel? They're in the wash, I'm afraid. I just have to drip dry. Oh, well... What's a bit of hypothermia between friends? Um, uh, there isn't any way I could stay the night, is there? You could always ask Wendy at the Dog and Duck. Well, I was thinking more, um, here. But I couldn't help noticing it's, it's rather a large property. Oh, all right. One night, you can have the sofa. <laughs> yeah, well, um, sofa, so good. <laughs> is that supposed to be funny? Not really, it was just a, a piece of wordplay to fill in a frankly terrifying silence. James, I came here to get away from me and you and all our highs and lows and from Carsley and all its murders. But it seems that both you and the Grim Reaper follow me wherever I go. So do you think it possibly was murdered, this Tolly chap? Well, it looks like it. He was found in a large empty lighthouse, locked from the inside. I see. So what we have is a locked room mystery. Well, if this was Edgar Allan Poe, then the monkey did it. And if it was Arthur Conan Doyle, then a snake slithered down the bell pull. <laughs> but as this is real life, it was probably suicide. Really? Do you really think so? Look, the police say there was no one else on the property when he died, so there's only one possible explanation. Why, but you're actually listening to the police. I must send a postcard to Bill Wong. <laughs> James... Sometimes you have to forget conspiracy theories, urban myths, and accept that things often are what they appear to be. Good Lord, the sea air really has done something to you. Oh, thanks for reminding me. Cigarette time. Ah, thank goodness that's the old Agatha we know and... Uh... What's that? What's what? I mean, the flashing red light. Oh, it's your answer phone. Oh, that. I keep forgetting to check it. I tend to use the phone upstairs. Don't you want to know who it is? Oh, well, I suppose so. Hello, Mrs. Raisin. It's Tolly here. Tolly Danvers. It's him. Got hold of your number from old Popwell. Hope you don't mind. Uh, just to say, I found out what your fairies are. <laughs> it's good news. It's very good news indeed. Look, um, I'm calling from the pub. It's uh, nine o'clock Monday evening. What say I swing by tomorrow morning and have a chat with you? Uh, take care. Bye. So that was Tolly. It was indeed. And two hours before they found him dead. Well, I would say suicide seems a little less likely. I heard the phone ringing yesterday evening, and I just assumed it was someone wanting to know what kind of ketchup I leave on the side of my plate. I wish I'd picked it up now. What did he mean, I found out what your fairies are? Oh, that. I've got fairies at the bottom of my garden. What? Little dancing lights floating in the sky that disappear whenever you go near them. Good Lord. Well, well as the rain has stopped, I may as well go and have a look. Oh, excuse me, Timbers. Everyone in the village denies they're there, but I can see them. I keep thinking it's some poisonous insect or hideous genetic mutation. Oh, yes, there they are, dancing about in the bushes. Can you see them too? Of course I can see them or I wouldn't be talking about them. No idea what they are, though. James? Yes? Perhaps it's not entirely a bad thing that you're here. Good Lord, an olive branch. No, not quite. But it is nice there's someone else in this world who can actually see my fairies. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy, Lucy by Rebecca Sayre, Tolly by Mark Straker and Mr Popplewell by Stephen Critchlow. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Episode 6, Murder in the Dark. Now, where's the print button? Ah, now, P. 
pages one to ten, draft quality and okay. No! Jeffers, please, it's the middle of the night. We don't want to wake up, Agatha. What's uh, going on? Too late. Hello there. Did you sleep? No, not really. I kept having dreams of lonely men in lighthouses blowing their brains out. What are you typing? Are those your notes about the murder? Oh, uh, something like that. Now, now, did you want to discuss the case? Well, I'd rather get some sleep, but all I can do is lie in bed torturing myself. <laughs> and I can just as well do that vertically as horizontally. Right, well, well, let's see. Two days ago, Tolly Danvers, internet millionaire, shot himself. Or did he? He seemed happy, healthy, and he'd even arranged to see me the next day. And yet police are convinced that he pulled the trigger. And there was nobody else on the property. It was a rather magnificent converted lighthouse. Bought with the proceeds of his website, boytoys.com. Purveyors of paintballing kits, miniature Ferraris and all sorts of gadgets and gizmos. He leaves behind a grief-stricken but immensely wealthy widow. That's mystery number one. Then there's mystery number two. The fairies. Yes, or whatever it is that's causing the lights at the bottom of my garden. Tolly said he knew what they were, and it was good news. But before he could come round to tell me, he was found dead in his lighthouse with a bullet in his head. Oh, yes, that's another thing. What is? I don't mean to sound insensitive, but if you lived in a lighthouse and you wanted to kill yourself, why would you go to all the bother of buying a gun? I mean, it's much easier to jump. And you do get the most marvellous views on the way down. I'm amazed the estate agents don't put that in their brochure. And there's something else. I haven't mentioned it up till now. What's that? Well, when I visited Tolly in his secret room at the top of the lighthouse, there was a smell of perfume. A sickly, sweet, incredibly cloying kind of perfume. Strange thing for a chap to be wearing. He wasn't wearing it. It was in the room. But now I realise where I'd smelt it before. On Wendy, the landlady at the Dog and Duck. Oh, I see. So perhaps when Mrs. Tolly was on her little shopping trips, he invited other people into his grade two listed tower. Come up and, uh, and make my light shine brightly. So, have you got any theories? Um, no. Not as yet. Well, let's have a look at your notes then. Uh, 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 no, please, please don't. I, I, I'm still working Number on them. Number 77... <sighs> She has a foul temper and lashes out at the slightest provocation. She never looks after her health and smokes like a dark satanic... Sorry, which suspect is this? Actually, no, it's, it's not a suspect. No? It's all about you. I was making a list of things I dislike about you and reasons why we shouldn't be together. What? There's about six pages here. Yes, and I do have some supplementary ones in the manila folder. James, have you been sitting up all night bitching about me on your laptop? Yes, it was either that or lie in bed thinking it. And as you say, you can do these things just as well vertically as horizontally. And what do you mean, reasons why we shouldn't be together? I thought we'd split up for good. Yes, well, we have. Good. Splendid. Excellent. Uh, so I suppose by listing reasons why we're not compatible, I'm just reinforcing an already sound decision. Fine. Marvellous. Well... If that's your game, I don't see why I should sit here and watch you do it. You write your little schoolboy essay. You could even get it published in the Carsley Gazette. You might win a book token. Come on, Chivers, let's go to bed. We know when we are not wanted. Reason 79. She is quite incapable of taking constructive criticism. Oh, morning, Wendy. Hello, oh, Sid. Just come for the papers. How are you doing? Oh, not too bad. Uh, terrible business about that tolly, though. Oh, don't I just know it? I can't get it out of my head. You, uh, you were quite close to him, weren't you? What's that supposed to mean? Just because I'm pleasant to my customers. Uh, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I, I wonder, would you have such a thing as a local paper? Oh, not as Cornish folk, no. As relies on the signs in the seaweed and mysterious lights in the sky. Yeah. Oh, stop winding him up, Sid. <laughs> Give him the paper. That'll be 50 pence. <laughs> right. Oh, well, I'm here. I wouldn't mind trying one of those rather fine-looking Cornish pasties. Oh, we have a connoisseur, do we? Well, well these are hand-crimped and contain only the finest organic ingredients. Mm. Just a thing for gentlemen of discernment like yourself. Good God, this is absolutely disgusting. James, oh. why are you spitting on my cat? Oh, I didn't mean to, but do you know what they've put inside this pasta? No, I don't know. Frog spawn? 
curried pilchards, Brussels sprouts. It's got raspberry jam in it. There's minced beef at one end and a big dollop of jam at the other. What's wrong with that? Well, well, I'm sure it's against the laws of Leviticus. James, the traditional Cornish pasty has meat at one end and jam at the other. So the tin miners could have a complete meal underground. Yes, but what if they went for the wrong end? I mean, you don't want to start off with a jam sandwich, do you? They are very sensual people, the Cornish. They know how to find their way around all that crimping in the dark. Right, well, if you don't mind, mine's going out for the gannets. Fine. Now, are we going to discuss this case, or are you going to finish that little essay you were writing about me? Well, um, I, I was actually going to have a look at the local paper, see if we can find out any more news about Tolly. Uh, oh, I'll do that. You can pick up all the crumbs from the carpet. Police in Fryfam are investigating the apparent suicide of a dot-com millionaire. Tolly Danvers, 42, was found shortly before midnight on Monday with a gunshot wound to the front of his head and a gun on the floor beside him. Police had received reports of a shot being fired at the lighthouse where he lived and arrived to find the building in total dark. That's odd. What is? The darkness. I mean, he was found in the lamp room. Mm. It's 59 steps up. He can hardly have gone all that way in the dark. Yes, though he possibly turned out the light when he got there. Particularly if what he was going to do wasn't all that pleasant. And why did he shoot himself in the forehead? I mean... I thought most suicides held the gun to the temple. It gives you somewhere to rest it. And, of course, you don't have to stare down the barrel. Yeah, well, it's one of those things that's quite hard to conduct a straw poll on. The whole thing stinks like yesterday's kippers. If that was suicide, I'm the captain of the English rugby team. Agatha? Yes. I've just had a thought. Oh, yes? Cornish pasties. No, thanks. I've just had cigarettes and coffee. No, no, no. I mean, the Cornish make these rather esoteric pasties with meat at one end and jam at the other. Now... Supposing for a practical joke, you decided to swap the sweet and the savoury rind, and someone who was expecting meat actually got a mouthful of raspberry jam. James, I have to say, I don't quite see the point of this. Look, supposing there was a, a device that Tolly used to use, a hairdryer, an electric toothbrush, but someone swapped it round. So instead of brushing his teeth, he actually shot himself in the forehead. Most people can tell the difference between a toothbrush and a gun. So that is one way of getting rid of plot. I'm saying the killer might have constructed something which made Tolly think he was doing something innocent when he was actually pulling a trigger. Well, what happened to that device? The police never found it. What if someone got to the house before the police? Look, the house was like Fort Knox. No one could have got into the building before the police smashed the doors down. Oh, looks as though you've got visitors. No, oh, that'll be Mr. Popplewell, estate agent to Cornwall in the southwest region of Hell. Right, Raymond, as you can see, we've access right down to the beach. And we can fence that off for residents only. Uh, hang on, isn't that a public right-of-way? Well, technically, but there's always a way round these things. Uh, I do have enormous influence Morning, on the... Morning, Mr. Oh. I assume you're here to convert the potting shed into a multi-storey car park? Oh, Mrs. Raisin, no, as a matter of fact, I'm showing my developer your cottage. As soon as your tenancy expires, I intend to pursue a much more upmarket clientele. Tolly, show me the architect's plans. They appear to be drawn by an eight-year-old with crayons. What? How nice to meet you. But, uh, Mrs. Wait. Raisin, you really mustn't get stuck in the past. And why should only one resident get a sea view? My executive flats will provide them with dozens. Yes, whilst blocking the sea view of people who already live here. Oh, there's no point arguing with you. People always say that when I'm winning. Morning. But... Oh, is, uh... Is this your husband? No. Uh, this uh, Lizzie, is my... uh, Colonel James Lizzie. I'm Arthur of Popplewell, uh, and this is my associate, Raymond Wells. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, what? Well, if you're wanting a look around the property, I was thinking Mrs. Raisin and I could go for a stroll up to Camelick Gifts. Oh, well, that's very thoughtful of you. I don't want Come to along, Elsa. Goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> oh, and I want you to replace the bulb in the front hallway. It keeps popping. Will do, Mrs. Raisin. Have a nice time. <laughs> when you get to the edge. Just keep walking. <laughs> James, why did you drag me away in the middle of a conversation? Because I didn't want you antagonising someone who could be useful. That man's about as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike. What was the last thing Tolly said to you? He said he'd solved the mystery of the fairies. The strange lights in my garden. Yes, the garden that Mr. Popplewell's about to build his flats on. Do you think that's connected to his death? I think we should keep all our avenues open, don't you? Ah, so, it is a lighthouse. How can you tell? Was it the giant bulb that gave it away? Marvellous place to live. Yes. 
Though it seems wrong for it still to be so shiny and white. I almost feel they should paint it black for the next few weeks. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. Lucy, I hope this isn't a bad time. Well, I'm not busy, if that's what you mean. Um, come in. Thanks. This is James, my... Uh, my next-door neighbour from Carsley. How do you do? Uh, have a seat. Uh. I would offer you coffee, but I've given my entire supply to the police and reporters. Every Tom, Dick and Harry. Uh, would you like me to pop down to the shops and get you some? No, that's uh. all right. I'll manage. How are you coping, Lucy? How am I coping? Well, I, I just am coping. I don't have much alternative. Well, I suppose I do, but I'm not going down that road. But you said something that puzzled me. You said this place does something to people, that it did something to Tolly. Well, it did. It changed him. Changed his name for a start. What do you mean? Well, he only called himself Tolly when he moved here. Back in London, he was always Terry or Tell. I think he thought a posh name would help him fit in. Oh, I see. And did it? Oh, no. They were only too happy to take his money at the golf club. But unless you've been living here since the Doomsday Book, they just see you as, um... As a... Oh, well, what's that ghastly word they use? An Emmet. <laughs> you weren't so keen on the move here, were you? Biggest mistake we ever made. And for poor Tolly, it was his last. Back in London, there was always someone he could phone and go for a pint with. But as soon as he made his pile, he suddenly decided he wanted to live in the middle of nowhere... And that can do funny things to your mind. But, Lucy, when I saw him, he seemed so cheerful. Things aren't always what they seem, Mrs. Raisin. And you can't always tell from the outside. How does that poem go? I was much further out than you thought, and not waving but drowning. Sir, was it the weeping widow or perhaps the evil estate agent... There is a third possibility. Yes? The buxom barmaid, who I suspect served Tolly a little more than pints. She's next on the list. Oh, good. That time we saw someone buxom. Well, you're welcome to flirt with her. The last man who did ended up dead. And then there's the mystery of the fairies. Or whatever it is makes those lights at the bottom of my garden. Yes, I'd quite like to get a closer look at those. Tolly said he knew what they were, but perhaps that's one thing he's taken to the grave with him. It has to be a rational explanation. Is there? Maybe the world is flat. Perhaps there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. Um, maybe everyone uh, will live happily ever after. Yes. Who knows? Agatha, what are you doing? What do you mean? I'm skimming. Oh, I see. I mean, you're getting it all wrong. First of all, you're much better off if you launch it from a lower level. So if you bend down like... James, so... get off me. Well, I'm just showing you how to do it properly. And you're much better off if you find a, a round, flat step. Look, you've got to understand, I might not want your help. Sometimes it's nice to learn things for yourself, even if you do mess up. Well, if you want to make a fool of yourself... Yes, I'm quite sure all the mollusks are sniggering in their shells. I'm off to the pub. Well, there's no need to take offence. James, there was no need for you to compile your list this morning. The reason we'll never be together is that deep down you're still an army colonel and I'm someone who can never take orders, right? Let's go and see Wendy. Oh, yeah, it's one of those days. Wendy, we're over here. No, look, you'll have to be quick. It's our bingo night Wednesday. I've got a lot to set up. No, we won't keep you long. Uh, have you met James? Well, we've uh, nodded at each other in the village shop. And it's a pleasure to be nodding at you once again. <laughs> right, well, we mustn't keep you away from your, um, your balls. So, um, if we could just get our eyes down, then you can get back to your full house. James, <laughs> let me do the talking. Uh, we wanted to have a chat with you about Tolly. Oh, yeah, I heard you've been snooping around the village asking questions. It's just there are certain things about his death that don't add up. You were the last person to see him alive. Did he, um, seem in good spirits? <laughs> he was in very good spirits. Mostly vodka and tonic. And yet he went straight home and killed himself. Well, that's the official story, but, uh, I reckon if you want the truth, you need to go and see that wife of his. Oh, we've, we've just been to see her, actually. Lovely woman. Terribly grief-stricken. Oh, do you reckon? 
Well, I think she can turn those waterworks on when she wants to. At least when she's got company. Well, whatever the state of their marriage, she, she must be distraught. Oh, must she now? When she's the one what drove him to it. Oh, do you think so? You don't think it was anything to do with the guilt he felt that he was having an affair with you? Oh, who says I was having an affair with Tolly? It was common knowledge. <laughs> And your perfume was all over his private room. Oh, I see. And uh, that would be uh, this perfume? Oh. oh <coughs> good Lord, that's all, awfully potent stuff. I make this stuff myself, I do. Out of rose petals. I've got quite a reputation for my perfume. So, if any local lady should have a date with a gentleman friend, she'll buy a bottle. Which is why so many wives think I'm doing the dirty with their husbands. It's not me they're having it off with. It's another woman who's wearing my scent. So who was Tolly having an affair with? Well, it wasn't another woman. And it wasn't another man, neither, if that's what you're thinking. Tolly was in a long-term relationship with the Wicked Weed. What? Oh, tobacco? The very same. He was a secret smoker. And he knew that his wife wouldn't approve. So he only smoked in the top room of his lighthouse. And he used my perfume to get rid of the smell. But surely his wife must have guessed. Oh, no, no, not a bit of it. My perfume covers up all sorts of dirty secrets. Well, Mrs. Raisin, has that been of use to you? Absolutely, Wendy. Bingo. Agatha, I still don't quite see the relevance. Oh, listen, James. There has got to be... Where are you? Over here. I wish they'd get some street lighting in this wretched place. Now, what were you saying about outsiders coming in and interfering? Well, if they want to carry on living in the dark ages... Here, you can take my arm. I think we're on the home stretch now. Look, there has got to be a connection. He came home roaring drunk, staggered up 59 steps, and he was gasping for a... Don't move. What is it? I think I can see your fairies. Where? Over there. And I've seen them before. In the south of France. What are they? Lampris noctiluga. The glowworm. But it's the wrong part of the world, surely. Oh, global warming. I thought it was the wrong time of year. But sometimes little miracles happen. Of course. I know what Tolly meant. Meant by what? I found out what your fairies are, and it's good news. What does he mean? Well, if they've got some rare species living here, it's going to be a lot harder for Mr. Popplewell to get out his wrecking ball. You don't think Popplewell had anything to do with the murder, do you? No, surely not. Though God knows I'd like to see a few estate agents behind bars. I'm just disappointed they weren't real fairies. Well, maybe they are. What do you mean? Well, just from the villages in Dire Straits... And a beautiful piece of heritage is about to be torn down. These appear, and they grant everybody's wishes. Yes, I suppose they do, really. <laughs> Ooh, I really think we'd best get indoors. Honestly, it wouldn't be the English seaside without a bit of rain. Cheers! Cheers! Oh, well done, Mr. Popplewell. I asked for a new light bulb, so he gives me one that blows every light in the house. It's funny. You never know what darkness is till you move right out of the country. No street lights, no cars, and a dark and stormy night. Thank heavens for cigarettes. Well, I would normally try and discourage you, but we need every bit of light we can get. James. What's the matter? We've just walked into the house, and a bulb blew, so what's the first thing I do? Light a cigarette, but then that's... Always the first thing you do. And supposing someone put a faulty bulb in the lighthouse so when Tolly goes into the lamp room, it blows a fuse. What's the first thing he's going to do? Well, he'd light a cigarette, but that doesn't explain why he shot himself. Tolly made a fortune selling gadgets and gizmos. What if he should have one of those novelty cigarette lighters, the ones that look like replica pistols? Only when he goes to his desk drawer, someone's replaced it with a real pistol. Oh, Agatha, I think you're descending into the realms of fiction. James is the perfect crime. In a locked room, in an empty house, he holds a gun to his head and pulls the trigger. But, but surely he would have had the cigarette lighter in his pocket. Not in this day and age. You don't carry anything that looks like a gun with you. 
Well, it still seems the most preposterous explanation. Well, look it up on the internet. See if he sold them. Oh, right. My computer's battery-powered, so, so that should be working. Then I'll see if I can find the fuse box. Um, just as soon as I, I found my way into the living room. Shivers! <sighs> She's terrified of storms. Where is she? No. Let's see. Boytoys.com. James. Thanks, sir. I just had a thought. Oh, yes. On Sunday night, Tolly went into his lamp room, flicked a switch, and all the lights went out. Well, so your theory goes. Isn't it interesting that the same things just happened to us? Oh, dear. I see what you mean. Well done, Mrs. <gasps> Raisin. And I'll save you the trouble. We do sell replica pistol cigarette lighters, along with bugging devices so you can hear what people are saying about you, and skeleton keys to get you into every house. Lucy, I had a feeling we might meet again. Uh, where's Chivers? I locked her in the cellar. Couldn't stand her endless hissing. I'll just go and get her. Stay where you are. And in case you're wondering, no, this is not a cigarette lighter. Although that's one way to give up smoking. Oh, yes, it's a Glock 18 by the looks of it. You know about guns, do you? Well, I was in the army for 30 years. We didn't spend all our time on productions of the Mikado. I bought this in a pub in Bethnal Green. You can get all sorts, you know. Guns, drugs, plasma screen TVs. Honestly, who needs Harrods? Well, I have to say, you took a huge risk. I'm not saying I approve, but it's hard not to be impressed. I learned all about risk from watching Tolly run his businesses. It was one harebrained scheme after another. But he always said, if you believe in something hard enough, you can make it happen. Lucy, why did you have to kill him? What had he done? What had he done? Besides dragging me out to the middle of nowhere, locking me in that wretched tower, taking me away from friends and family. And you killed him for that? I tried to get a divorce. I tried to walk away. But every penny of my money was tied up in his business. And I just couldn't face another winter in bloody Cornwall. Uh, now, now, look, Lucy. Here's my mobile phone. You can dial uh, 999 and all the guilt you feel, all, all the fear of being caught, will all be over. Well, why would I want to do that, for God's sake? Because, Lucy Danvers, you killed your husband. And you're now standing in Samphire Cottage, Fryfam holding a gun to two people's heads. There's no need to describe everything. What do you think this is, Jack and Nori? James, don't provoke her. I think I know what I'm doing. But, of course, you, you can't actually use that gun, can you? Because if the police found another two bodies in such a small village... Oh, I'll be long gone by then. Besides, you're going in the sea. Who knows when or where you'll wash up. Well, are we at least allowed to say our last goodbyes? Of course. I'm not a complete monster. Now, up against the wall, in the moonlight, where I can see you. Oh, James, I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. Well, perhaps it's the army training, but a dangerous situation actually helps me to see things more clearly. Uh, and can I just say, from the very first moment I saw you, when your car crashed into mine on a snow-covered road, I've loved you more than anything else in the world. Admittedly, there were also times I wished to kill you, but on balance, I'd say the five years I've spent with you have been infinitely superior to the 50 years without you. James? Yes? Did it really take a woman pointing a gun to your head for you to say, I love you? you well, I suppose it did, really. Perhaps it would have been possible without the firearm, but um, now we'll never know. Thank you, James. Goodbye. Goodbye, Agatha. No! Right, Agatha, run! What? Get back! I forgot to say, the police are on their way when I gave you my mobile and already dialed their number. No! 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 Chivers? Chivers? Are you down here? No! Oh, there you are. Did the nasty woman lock you in the cellar? Well, don't worry. I think it's her turn to be shut inside a dark room. Good Lord, there must be half an inch of water down here. I'll just go and get a mop it and buck... I mean, bucket and mop. Sorry, still a bit shaken. James? Yes? 
those things you said when you had a gun to your head, were you playing for time or did you really mean them? Well, of course I was playing for time. <laughs> you didn't seriously believe all that mush about hearts missing a beat and star-crossed lovers? No. <laughs> Good job the police got here when they did. I doubt if I could have filled a, a whole half hour with terms of endearment. I'm amazed you managed 30 seconds. <laughs> On the other hand, it, it is true that the five years since I met you have been rather more interesting than the uh, 50 years before. Oh, so I haven't completely ruined your life? No, just um, reconstituted it somewhat. Agatha. Yes? You know when our attempt at marriage went all pear-shaped, and, and I said it was over between us and we could never, ever get married? Yes, James, my memory hasn't gone completely. Well, could I possibly repeat that sentence, but this time replace the word... Never. With the phrase, um, quite possibly. But all we ever do is fight with each other. Well, I can't bear the silence when we're not fighting. But we haven't got anything in common. <laughs> well, you wouldn't want to have anything in common with me, would you? It's sheer stupidity. Yes, but I've had 55 years of searing intellect, and frankly, I don't much care for it. We could get a little holiday home here, and come out every night and, and feed the fairies. Oh... James. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we must be mad. Completely mad. Totally stark staring bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> do you really think it'll work? I mean, do you really think we've got a future? Well, there's only one way to find out. Of course, it could all end in murder. That wouldn't surprise me in the least. Mm. Well, over your dead body or mine. <laughs> <laughs> In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy, Lucy by Rebecca Sayre and Mr Popplewell by Stephen Critchlow. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was...